Hey there, Mr. Redder here. Welcome back to another episode of Reddit Podcast Stories, where today, my Karen niece demands I pay the down payment on a house that she wants. Not gonna happen, Karen. I'm male, 54. My niece, Sierra, who's 25, is an only child and she just got married about three months ago. My sister, who's 58, admitted to me that she and her husband paid over $35,000 for her wedding at a venue on the coast. They had to dip in their home equity for most of that money. My wife, who's 53, and I make significantly more money than my sister and her husband, but we live well within our means. We do splurge on once a year vacations and we paid for our kids' educations, but that's it. We even cap how much we're allowed to spend on each other for our birthdays or Christmas, etc. When our kids, who are 30, 28, and 24, got engaged, we offered to either pay for their dream wedding or host their wedding at my parents' lake house and gift them the balance of a down payment on their homes. About the lake house, my parents are deceased. My sister and I own it, renting it out most of the time and splitting the money. It's more than maintenance costs, but not that much more. All three of our kids took us up on the offer, so all three are homeowners. This kind of nuked our accrued savings for a bit, but we've built back up a sizable amount since then and we're glad to help our kids get a solid financial base in life. My sister told me she offered the same deal to Sierra, but Sierra wanted her dream wedding instead. I thought she was crazy, but she's not my daughter, so it's none of my business. Well, it became my business. Apparently, Sierra's been stewing over the last couple of months after my daughter and her husband hosted their first family 4th of July at their new home. It's not new, it was built over 40 years ago, but it is solid, has lots of room, a huge backyard, and my son-in-law has been working overtime with very impressive do-it-yourself projects. My sister told me Sierra had asked them for a down payment so they could get a house too. After paying Sierra's college tuition and expenses and her wedding, they're tapped out. I had a feeling Sierra would show up on my doorstep and that's exactly what she did. Sierra and her husband showed up with a cake. My wife loves cake. She told us about their honeymoon, how she loves being married and how much she looks forward to giving us grandnieces and grandnephews. The whole time, her husband is looking more and more uncomfortable. As soon as Sierra said, I just wish we could buy a house like my cousins, I just shook my head and said, No, Sierra, we're not giving you the down payment. She just froze for a moment, then asked me why not. We had the money, and we could even make it a loan, and they can pay us back if we wanted. I told her I don't loan money to family members. If I put money in a family member's hand, it's a gift. Life is just easier that way. I reminded Sierra that my kids have homes because instead of blowing $35,000 on a dream wedding, they spent far less to get married at their grandparents' lake house so the money they would have spent went to their down payment. I also reminded her that her mother offered her the same deal, but she refused it because she wanted her wedding to be, in her own words, better than theirs. Most importantly, I said that I'm not going to disrespect my own kids' wise financial decisions by rewarding her foolish decision. When she asked what was foolish, I said, all you were thinking about was the wedding. My kids were thinking about their marriages. Of course, this upset Sierra and she left in tears. Her husband apologized, but I'm not sure if it was because she was crying, they were leaving in such an awkward way, or if he thought Sierra was wrong. Anyway, my sister said that she agrees with me, but that I'm still a jerk because I was so blunt about it. I'll admit that I am blunt while my sister sugarcoats everything. My wife, my kids, and my brother-in-law, Sierra's father, are all in complete agreement but the consensus does seem to be that it's not what I said, but how I said it. ETA, my kids joke that I'm as subtle as a sledgehammer. I guess that's why I'm here. Was I the jerk for being as blunt as I was? Not the jerk. You gave her a much needed lesson in the consequences of choices. If you want to talk about jerk behavior, Sarah wanting to one up your kids on the wedding and then use your money to pay for her petty move is the height of jerk behavior. She deserved every word you said and more. And nothing you said was rude. Blunt isn't necessarily rude. OP probably saved himself a lot of unnecessary begging by making his answer clear. With people like his niece, if you sugarcoat it, they take it as a sign that there's a space for negotiation and then you're in for a world of awkwardness. Not the jerk. Like you said, she had a choice between a wedding and a house. She chose the wedding. A lot of people don't like it when you tell them the truth. In this case, she needs to be told the truth. You don't want her to think that she has any hope in the future to get money from you. To put it even more bluntly, no chance in heck. Well, what would you do if you were OP? Would you pay for your niece's down payment or not? Please let us know. If it weren't for these stories, I never would have had a clue how many people feel entitled to other people's money. Deny my ability to use my backyard when my dog is dying? All right, you'll no longer be able to enjoy yours. A couple months ago, our lovely older pit bull was fighting cancer and we had the painful decision made to have her put down. 
She was low on energy at this point. Moving was difficult and getting her to eat was near impossible. With that, one of the only things we wanted to give her was one last day outside in the backyard. So the day before she was to be put to sleep, in the early morning, I set out to set up a tent in the backyard and filled it inside and outside with things our dog absolutely loved. I noticed as I was setting things up, the neighbor behind us was placing sticks and leaves in their fire pit, which normally I wouldn't care at all, but the poor dog is having trouble breathing at this point. I figured it wouldn't be an imposition to let them know my current situation and ask if they could postpone the burning just for today. The wife let me know that they are just going to be burning a few things to clear their yard and it won't last very long at all, and she gave me some level of understanding about the dog. With that, she lit up the fire and the smoke billowed into my backyard. For some context, the neighbor is directly behind my property. I have about a 100 foot by 100 foot backyard and theirs is about 50 foot by 100 foot. Just to add to this, I don't mind if people are burning things around me. I'm not particularly fond of it, but if it makes them happy, then it makes me happy. A few hours go by. I notice they're still outside adding more things to the fire. I approach them and ask kindly on the ETA, trying to be as patient and understanding as possible. They say they're almost done. A few hours later, there's a raging fire outside and I can visibly see the husband outside pointing at my home, yelling and then adding actual campfire logs, no longer leaves and sticks. At this moment, I'm not angry, I'm just very sad. Poor dog isn't going to have the last day we wanted to give her. We would take her somewhere else, but we don't want to stress her out, so we spend the rest of the day inside. Later that night, around 9pm, as the sun is setting, I go out for a walk and I notice the fire is still roaring. Mind you, as it was most of the time, with no one there. At this moment, I'm now ticked off and starting to look into state laws, city laws, and everything in between. From this, I found out that my city has an ordinance that clearly states that a fire pit cannot be within 50 feet of a structure. I could, if I wanted to, contact the city and have it stopped simply because no matter where they place it in their backyard, it will be within 50 feet of their home. But that seems non-permanent enough. I was already considering getting a fence installed and already had multiple quotes. It was hard to swallow a bill for $15,000. But within 24 hours of this situation, guess what I paid for? The fence will be installed within the next couple of weeks around the edge of my property and their fire pit is no further away than 10 feet from my fence. Can't take a single day away from your fire pit for my dying dog? Well, enjoy never being able to use it again. My dad kicked me out as a teen, but I had the last laugh. When I was 17 years old, I would mostly just play World of Warcraft and do the bare minimum in high school. During my senior year, I had over 20 absences, most involved me skipping to play games. I lived in a rural farmhouse, so internet was expensive and unreliable. This is 2008. We were poor and didn't have internet, but my neighbor did, and unbeknownst to my dad, 46 male, and stepmom, 32 female, I set up a wireless extender, with that neighbor's permission, so I could do homework. It just barely reached my bedroom and the back deck. I'd play games in my room on the internet all the time and my parents didn't even realize I had internet. They just figured that World of Warcraft was another non-internet game and I didn't enlighten them. As I got close to graduation, I did some self-reflection and decided to give video games up. I had given them up for an entire week and was so proud of myself that I decided to open up to my father and tell him about my progress. I told him that I had had internet for over 6 months and that it reached my bedroom. I didn't mention the extender. My dad was not pleased that I had been playing this many games under his nose. Up until then, he was a fairly absentee parent, but then he wanted to lay down the law and he demanded to take permanent possession of my laptop so he could sell it and presumably cut me off of any future gaming. This felt unfair to me because the laptop was a gift from my grandmother and I couldn't afford to replace it. He also wanted to drive me to and from school where I previously had a lot more freedom on a bike. I was almost 18 years old and felt like I had taken care of my own problems and didn't need this. I didn't give my dad the laptop. I had hidden it under one of my dad's broken cars. When it became clear I wouldn't surrender my laptop, my dad didn't take it well and lost it on me. I moved out to my friend's house a few farms over to finish high school. His parents were super supportive. They didn't like my dad much. I wasn't welcome back at my dad's house. On one occasion, when I saw my dad and stepmom's car gone, I snuck into the house to get my things. My stepmom had already packed up my room into neat boxes. Weirdly, I noticed that my dad's entire computer setup was on the house's back porch. He was using the internet. No doubt for videos that he was watching behind my stepmom's back. On my way out, I walked to the edge of the property where the wireless extender was and I took it with me. He didn't even know about it anyway. When I finally did talk to my dad eight months later, he asked if I knew how to fix the internet.
Am I the jerk for refusing to take down my Dodgers gear when I live in enemy territory? I'm a fourth generation Angelino, Los Angeles native, and a diehard Dodgers fan. I had to move out of state because my work moved its headquarters to Texas and because it was becoming too expensive to live in LA. I currently live in Houston. My wife and I hate it here. We regret it and we're looking to move soon. We still love LA, so we have reminders from home everywhere. I adore baseball, so my car has Dodgers stickers. I wear Dodgers shirts on the regular and I have a Dodgers flag flying on the front lawn. My neighbors don't like it. Of course they don't because it's Houston so they're Astros fans. For those who don't know, the Houston baseball team, the Astros, cheated during the 2017 World Series and got away with it. So yeah, we get told to get over that year often. Recently I got a letter from the HOA telling me to take down my flag because it's an eyesore. I say no way Jose because there is nothing in the bylaws limiting what flags I can have up. Also, my neighbors have more offensive flags up and I don't see anyone complaining about them. I threw the letter away, but we still got neighbors telling us to get over that game and to deal with it. As for me, my wife thinks we should take the flag down until we move and is not happy when I told the obnoxious neighbor that we won our World Series title fair and square, unlike you guys. Am I the jerk? I don't think I am, but my wife does. Update. We moved back to Los Angeles over the summer. Things weren't as hard as my wife and I would have thought. We looked around online and recruited our family and friends to what we called Operation Get Out. The objective was to find an affordable place to go live and get out of here. Given everything going on over there, we didn't want to raise our daughters in Texas. Also, all of our family and friends were in California and we wanted her to know her grandparents. With the help of my father-in-law, we bought a small house half an hour away from Los Angeles. It's a fixer-upper, but my wife has been loving the renovation project so far. We just finished the kitchen and the nursery. My wife can't wait to tackle the living area next year. I found a new job that lets me work from home a couple of days a week so I can stay with our girl. Speaking of our girl, she hadn't been born when I made my post. My wife and I took a baby moon trip to Mexico to enjoy our last vacation before she arrived. Only Hannah decided that she didn't want to be born in Texas and crashed the trip. I'm a little disappointed that we broke this cycle of the fifth generation born in LA, but Hannah is a healthy, strong girl and that's more important. And we have an interesting story as to why our half-Asian daughter now has Mexican citizenship. Thanks for confirming that I'm not a jerk. Viva los Dodgers! Am I the jerk for not making an effort to increase my child support payments after coming into some money? I got divorced five years ago and I lost a lot. My ex got the apartment and our car. I was okay with it because she had our kids and I wanted everything to be as stable as possible for them. I ended up moving in with my grandmother to make ends meet. My ex and I were doing a decent job of being co-parents, I thought. I spent a lot of time with my kids and I've never missed a child support payment. My grandmother became ill during lockdown and I was basically her caregiver. She made it through, but it really took a toll on her. She passed about two months ago. I'm an only child, but my parents are both irresponsible, which is why they couldn't help me out when I needed somewhere to live. My grandmother made me her main beneficiary when she passed. All that she said was to take care of my kids. I sold her house after I gave everyone their bequests. I took the money and the rest of the estate and I bought myself a house and a car. Her house was old and not in a great neighborhood for the kids. I also put money into my kids' educational fund. When my ex found out what I did, she was upset. She said that I owed her more child support now. I checked with my lawyer before I did anything. Money from an inheritance, the sale of a house, or a lottery win does not count as income. If I had invested the money instead, then the interest would count as income. She thinks I intentionally did her over. I think I now have a good reliable car for work and a nice small house in a good neighborhood for when I have the kids with me. We're fighting about it, but I don't think I'm in the wrong. You're not the jerk. It sounds like you spent several years living tight, sharing an apartment with your grandmother, taking care of her, etc. You certainly weren't living high on the hog then and you aren't now. You bought a small home and a reliable car, both things that will benefit your kids. You put money in their educational funds. It sounds like you're being really responsible with the money and she's just mad that she doesn't benefit from it. It's not like you came into a huge fortune and bought a beach condo and private plane. Even if you had, you still wouldn't owe your ex anything for our purposes here. I hope your lawyer is correct. No. If she wants to go back to court to get child support readjusted, she is within her right to do so. But just because you have a small windfall from a passing and ensuring that your kids have a safe way to and from your house that is also safe doesn't mean she is entitled to a cut of anything and everything you earn or receive financially. She isn't entitled to any windfall just because you have kids with her. 
Am I the jerk for suggesting my wife lower her standards so that she'll be less overwhelmed? My wife, 37 female, and I, 38 male, have three kids who are 12, 10, and 8. She's in a constant state of overwhelm and very easily irritated, constantly complaining how it's all too much. I'm of course happy to help and do my fair share for the kids or household, but it's never enough because our standards are too darn high. She insists one of us has to be up at 6.45 every morning to make sure the kids are ready and get to the bus on time, which comes at 7.45. I told her they're old enough to not need that much help already. They can all dress themselves and pour themselves cereal and milk. There's no reason for us to be up. She says that cereal isn't a good enough breakfast. They need something more substantial, especially the 12-year-old, and that the 10-year-old has ADHD and will definitely struggle without help in the morning. And anyway, she wants to see them off and kiss them goodbye for the day. So she gets up and I don't. Then she gets upset that I never give her a morning off when all she needs to do is just take the morning off when she wants and let the kids handle themselves. Also, she's super strict about screen time during the week and is exhausted and snappy from arguing about it with the kids and upset that I don't support her strict limit of two hours a day. I say as long as homework is done, why not until bed? She says it's not healthy for them. They need to play outside or with games and toys. Read some books, just entertain themselves in more ways than one. I agree that they should enjoy other things, but not seeing why we have to make such a rigid limit. She also likes to go out on weekends and do stuff like zoos, museums, etc., but then complains about the planning for the outing and how grouchy the youngest gets by the end of it. And again, I say, let's just chill at home and voila, you've cut the work. I'm an engaged and active parent. I'm not trying to get out of it, but I don't think I should have to help my wife dig herself out of her own self-created holes. She creates the stress for herself and then turns to me to alleviate it, which I think is unfair. Am I the jerk for telling her she needs to do less and then she won't need this level of help? You're the jerk. Your wife's standards are just being a decent parent and you're not doing your fair share if you aren't helping with these things you consider unnecessary. An 8-year-old and a 10-year-old with ADHD are not ready to totally get themselves ready in the morning and you'd know that if you didn't sleep through the morning routine every day. Two hours of screen time a day is a totally reasonable boundary, and family time and enriching activities are also important. Maybe those can be cut down slightly, but just chilling at home all the time isn't the answer either. Stop being lazy and become an actually engaged parent like your wife is. To be fair, a lot of kids around that age have to get ready on their own because their parents already left for work. I was one of them, and it was pretty normal in my social circles, and now I'm a teacher, and I know this from a lot of students. From when I was 8, my parents left at 4.45 and 6.30 for work, and I had to get up and get ready on my own. My mother called every morning at 7.15 to check in with me though. But if my parents would have been home and decided to sleep in instead of getting up with me, I 100% would have felt neglected. Where on earth would that be acceptable behavior from a parent? Wow, OP is completely out of touch with reality. You're an engaged and active parent? You don't sound like it. There are things a parent has to do for their kids in the mornings. Your youngest is eight. Cereal is nothing but sugar. A lot of moms don't want their kids to eat that every day. Two hours of screen time is generous, not strict. You sound rather checked out. You're the jerk. This is how this reads. My wife is a hands-on, active parent who wants our kids to have well-balanced meals, minimal screen time, and fun and stimulating outings, and that's too much work for me. I'd prefer my kids eat whatever they can find in the kitchen without bothering me. That we stay home and do nothing and the kids play on their devices and watch TV in their spare time. No wonder she's stressed. She sounds like a great parent and you come off sounding lazy and disinterested in parenting your own kids. You're the jerk. Not the jerk. She sounds like the kind of person who loves to make things difficult and unnecessary. That's how my mother always was and none of us could stand her. Growing up, we always wished our parents would have divorced and we could have gone with our dad. Life would have been so much more simple without my mother, who always insisted on things being done her way, her rules, her regulations. She's no longer with us, but even at her funeral, all anybody talked about was how bossy and controlling she was. I can't tell you what to do, OP, but if you want your kids to have actual childhoods without a dictator, you really might want to leave your wife. Some people create endless problems, then complain about them, and that's exactly what she's doing. She sounds so exhausting. My girlfriend thinks it's weird for her to pay me rent. My girlfriend, 29 female, and I, 27 male, have been together for about 5 years. For the first year and a half of our relationship, she lived at home with her parents, but spent most nights at the place I was renting at the time. In March 2020, I bought a house and she moved in with me. Until recently, I hadn't asked her to contribute much to household expenses, 
Because when she moved in, she was working part-time and simultaneously working on a master's degree and a professional certificate. I've been paying for all of the utilities as well as her car insurance and most of our groceries. A few days ago, I asked her to start paying for her share of the utilities and $500 a month towards the house. She didn't have any issue with paying towards the utilities, but she said it was weird of me to ask her to pay rent since it was my house and I would essentially be profiting off her payment. Eventually, she agreed to start paying me, but it seemed to be under protest. I think $500 is very reasonable, and I don't see how it's a weird request. It doesn't even cover half of the interest I pay each month on the mortgage. Some additional info. I make $140K each year, and she recently started making $40K. She's working on paying off student loans, but is going to have low monthly payments thanks to income-based repayment. My mortgage payment is $2,400 a month. Combined utilities are around $500 a month. We live in a high cost of living area. The home is a modest starter home. A decent apartment in the area would easily cost as much as my mortgage. I don't need the money, but it's important to me that I feel like we're both contributing towards the household expenses where we can. We do plan on getting married. We don't plan on having kids. We split the chores somewhat evenly. She definitely does more than I do since she has more time to spend at home, but I'd call it a 60-40 split. So, is it weird that I ask my girlfriend to pay me $500 in rent each month? It's pretty reasonable to ask her to pay rent. But if you want her to pay rent, you need to have a lease in place to protect both of you should your relationship end suddenly. You might also want to consider splitting the cost based on income percentage as opposed to a random number or 50-50 because there's such a large discrepancy between y'all's income and since you chose the area and size of the home that y'all are living in. If you're going to ask her to contribute to the house, she should benefit from that arrangement with a formal rent agreement that allows her to establish and keep a rental history in case y'all weren't to work out as a romantic partnership. I feel like instead of charging her rent, you should ask her to start paying for her own expenses, such as her car insurance and half the groceries and utilities. If she feels weird paying you directly, you could ask her to put the utilities in her name and pay them directly. That's what we do. My husband pays the mortgage, cable, and phones. I pay electric, gas, trash, and buy all groceries and household goods. His income is way higher than mine, so I pay what I can in order to contribute. It's not weird at all to ask for contribution to the household expenses. She lives there. $500 would not cover living almost anywhere these days. I wonder if she's saying that it's weird because she feels paying towards your mortgage is just giving you money for equity while not building any herself. She may be worried that if you broke up, all that time and money would have benefited her zero in terms of ownership. I know she could be renting and it would be the same, but maybe it's that she knows you versus a third party or a stranger. Or she could feel weird like it's a landlord-tenant relationship. However, I don't think you're taking advantage of her or unfair for her to pay rent. I think if you're renting, not building your own equity is pretty much the deal. Am I the jerk for giving my son non-vegan food behind my wife's back? I, 32 male, and my wife, 33 female. We've been married for 8 years and we have a 12-year-old son together. About 6 years ago, my wife decided to go vegan. She watched a documentary that a friend sent to her and ever since then has said non-vegan food is revolting and refuses to eat it. After a long conversation, I agreed to go vegetarian and be vegan in the house and around her but she was happy with it. She also decided our son should be vegan, which after seeing a dietitian, I also agreed with. Things had been fine with this arrangement until a few months ago when I began finding wrappers from non-vegan candy and even burgers from McDonald's in my son's school bag, which he had been buying with chore money. I had a conversation with my son and he confessed he felt lonely and excluded eating vegan around his friends and that they always had much better candy than he did and it wasn't fair. I decided I didn't want him spending his pocket money on snacks and throwing out the vegan snacks we actually bought him instead of buying games, etc. It made no sense, but I also know the way my wife feels about non-vegan products. So I began buying my son what he wanted on our way to football practice instead. Long story short, my wife recently found out what's been going on and completely flipped out. She called me an animal mistreatment enabler and a few other names and said that I was corrupting our son. Now she's not speaking to me. Our son panicked and told her I had bought the snacks for him and he didn't know that they weren't vegan. I don't blame him for that. He just doesn't want to be in trouble with his mom. Am I the jerk here? Not the jerk. I think that my answer at this point would be, our son is old enough to decide what he wants to eat and what his dietary preferences are. If we put him into a situation where he feels he has to hide things from us, that's on us. If your wife is confronting him about this in any kind of intimidating way or trying to make him feel guilty with the same phrases she's using with you, I would prioritize your son and his needs and well-being. Crap like this can cause a lot of problems. As a vegan, not the jerk. We humans are designed to eat meat, 
It's a perfectly normal thing for our bodies to do. In fact, I'm the abnormal one, not eating meat. I'm old enough to have made that choice and I'm happy. Your son shouldn't have his dietary preferences forced on him like this when building bonds is so important. It's his choice what he gets to eat and you're doing nothing wrong supporting him. Not the jerk. My spoiled daughter keeps taking the car without permission, so I put a tracker on it. I have a daughter who is 15 years old and recently got her instruction slash learner's permit after she took a summer driver's ed course and passed the written exam. In my state, the learner's permit has a driving restriction that requires the driver to have a licensed adult who's 21 or older in the front passenger seat with them at all times, no exceptions. She has to hold the learner's permit for at least one year before she can move up to a restricted license at 16 years old. We bought her a car during the summer so that she can have a familiar car to practice in with us while having her learner's permit. This will be the same car she will use once she gets her license. The problem is that she's been driving this car by herself without our permission or even informing us. Sometimes we leave our daughter home alone for a few hours so that we can go to the store or on a date, etc. And she's been secretly driving when we're not home. She has her own key and we have the spare. I found out after noticing the discrepancy in the miles in her car. We scolded her and told her that it was illegal for her to drive on her own and we started outlining the tires with chalk so that we would know if she used the car or not. However, the chalk does not automatically stop her from taking the car out. It only lets us know afterwards if she did. So she still kept using the car and would shrug us off afterwards. I don't want her breaking the law and I'm terrified of her driving on her own with so little experience although she seems to be doing fine as the car has no damage, so I secretly installed a GPS tracking device in the car. We then secretly pretended to leave and waited until we noticed that the car's location changed. I immediately called my daughter and yelled at her, telling her that she needed to come home now. She came back and we got into a huge fight, screaming, and it ended up in tears. She screamed that I was a controlling mother and was invading her privacy, and that this was her car since we bought it for her, so we had no right to secretly install the tracker without her permission. I talked to someone else about it, and they did say I took the wrong approach, and that it was wrong of me to install the tracker, and that I should have done something else. I would have taken the key back, but she refuses to give it to me, and I don't know where she keeps it. Am I the jerk for secretly installing a GPS tracker in my daughter's car? Edit. I do plan to remove the tracker once she gets her license. It's only while she has her learner's permit. Edit 2. Update. We drove the car to a local Walmart because I saw they're pretty friendly with truckers and van dwellers, so I figured that they wouldn't mind a car left overnight. We don't have anyone who lives nearby that we can keep the car at. I called an auto locksmith and they said that the earliest they can come out is tomorrow afternoon, so we're waiting on that. There's a lot of people who ask the same questions and I can't respond to everyone, so I'm just going to answer them here. Why did you buy her a car in the first place? I wanted her to be able to practice driving for her license in a car that would be familiar even after she got her license. That way she would feel more confident since she knows the car, where everything is, etc. Driving is scary, so I wanted it to be a really smooth transition from her learners to her license. This is also why we didn't think to sell the car either since we wanted to keep it for this reason. I told my husband about selling the car and he said he would think about it. He was the one who paid for it. Why did you give her a key in the first place? My parents bought me a car when I was 14 and had my learner's permit also. They immediately gave me a key to it and I never once drove the car without their permission despite always having the key. I thought my daughter would do the same thing. I've raised her almost exactly how my parents raised me so I thought she'd act the same way as I did in the same situation. Why haven't you taken the key? I've told her to give it back to me but she refuses and even when I searched her room I was unable to find it. Why haven't you done anything to punish her? I already told her she was grounded a long time ago and she does not get to use a smartphone. She still has a flip phone, I don't want to completely take away a phone because I still want her to be able to contact me in case of emergency, but has unrestricted access to her laptop because her homework is posted and submitted online. Why haven't you disabled the car? To be honest, both me and my husband don't know much about cars, so this didn't even occur to us to try. I'd never even heard of a steering wheel club before. We're the type of people who bring our car into the shop for any maintenance, so I didn't know how to disable the car, so the idea of removing parts of the car and such never occurred to us. Why did you think the chalk and tracker would work? Honestly, just because it would have worked on me when I was a teen. 
I didn't like upsetting my parents, so I never did things like this, and small minor punishments really quickly put me in my place growing up whenever I did misbehave. I thought the tracker was more serious than the chalk because it meant that I would find out she took the car almost immediately before she got too far. Take the keys from her. It's really as simple as that. But a GPS does not prevent your daughter's bad and dangerous behavior. Why does she still have unrestricted access to the keys? So, I guess you're the jerk for not preventing your 15-year-old from endangering innocent motorists. Honestly, I would sell the car. Your daughter is a spoiled brat. You might have to knock a couple hundred off the sale price since you only have one key. You're the jerk. Take the darn keys already. Good grief. Tracking her does nothing to prevent her from getting into an accident. You bought her a car, but I'm guessing it's in your name and you're the one paying on the insurance. Be a parent, not a sneak. Take the keys to your office or someplace outside your home and lock them up. A no-car diet should start immediately for her. Well, what would you do in this situation? How would you try to get the keys from your daughter? Please let us know. Just another example of why I'm so glad we don't have kids, Reddit boy. Karen keeps eating my microwave dinners and I've had enough. About six weeks ago, I, 21 female, moved in with my friend John, who's 22 male. John and I have been very good friends for almost two years now after I befriended him at work. Six months ago, he met this girl, Kat, who's 19. He told me about her the day after he matched with her on a dating app and took me to her workplace to meet her. She seemed very lovely and I was so happy for him. Since then, John is always inviting her to every friend outing, so I got to know her. We have lots in common, and for John's sake, I wanted to be her friend. However, I think that, in the nicest way possible, she's a bit rude. She does art, and half the time John compliments her work, she says, You hate it, don't you? Or times we hang out with other friends, we've had to go home early as she was bored, and John was our ride home. She hasn't done anything to me personally, but I just don't like her much. I'm happy John has found someone who he cares for, but having to stand by and watch how she acts sometimes rubs me the wrong way. Here's where the issue comes in. Yesterday, John and I were at the supermarket to do our food shop. Normally, we would buy our food for the week and maybe a couple of simple or frozen meals to save for Sunday. However, Kat has been coming over for dinners a few times a week and she has a very limited diet. She refuses to eat anything other than fast food or simple or frozen meals. She likely has her reasons for eating specific food, and in case it's due to an ED or something similar, I don't want to make things hard for her or pry into something that isn't my business. The time where it became an issue for me is how John has now wanted to buy backup meals for her in case she doesn't like what we're cooking. This would make sense, as before she has been eating stuff that was part of our weekly meal plan. The problem is, John wants me to financially contribute to these extra meals for her. When I spoke to John about this and said how I'm not happy paying half for her meals, our weekly shop cost is just split in half as we both eat everything, he got quite agitated. He called me selfish for not wanting to help her just to save money. I know frozen meals aren't the most expensive thing in the world, but John is in a much better financial situation than I am, and while I can pay my share of the bills and occasionally have outings with my friends, I don't want to be dishing out extra money for meals for a girl I have no real connection to as these small amounts do add up. In my eyes, if Kat doesn't like what we're cooking, she could come over on a different day, or John could buy backup meals for her out of his own pocket. I feel like a jerk, but I don't think I should be paying for an extra person's food. If my boyfriend had a similar situation to Kat, I'd see it as my responsibility to provide for him and his diet, and I'd never expect John to pay. Am I the jerk for thinking this way? Do any of you have any advice? Not the jerk but it's time to take a financial and social step back from John as he navigates his new relationship. He can't expect you to help finance the fact that his girlfriend eats like a kid and needs backup meals. That's their expense alone, and perhaps separate shopping is now in order as you two no longer have the same joint priorities. On the flip side, I also wouldn't continue to rely on John as a ride if you constantly want to stay out with friends later. It honestly sounds like your life paths are just splitting at this time, and it's best to acknowledge that and adjust expectations of each other accordingly before bitterness sets in. I'd also get ahead of any rent or living concerns sooner rather than later. If she's sticking around, it may be time to start planning an exit strategy. Nanny bought books for my daughter and expects me to pay her for them. My daughter Ruby is 12. Recently, she's gotten into the original Star Trek show, as well as The Next Generation. 
Ruby is also a big reader and has started to collect a few of the old Star Trek books that she finds in used bookstores and thrift stores. These books usually cost anywhere from 50 cents to a couple of dollars. My nanny, Tessa, who's 22, hangs out with Ruby most days after she gets out of school. Tessa has been our nanny for over a year now and she and Ruby get along great. Tessa is big into thrifting and will often keep an eye out for the books that Ruby wants. This is not typically a problem and Ruby always pays Tessa back for the books using her allowance. The problem occurred when Tessa went on a family vacation out west. Apparently, she went thrifting during this trip, found some books for Ruby. She texted Ruby asking her if she wanted the books and Ruby said yes. Well, Tessa returned yesterday with a stack of about 35 books and told Ruby they cost $50. Ruby doesn't have this much money and told Tessa. Tessa then asked me if I would cover the cost. I said no, as Tessa had never even asked me about buying Ruby the books, nor was I aware of the conversation between the two of them. Tessa got upset, and I asked Ruby to show me the text which made no mention of price or even the amount of books she was buying. Tessa only said that she found some books for Ruby. Ruby is on the spectrum and does not read between the lines. You have to be very literal with her. Previously, Tessa has never bought Ruby more than one or two books at a time, so I told her that she should have clarified with Ruby regarding the amount, or double-checked with me before purchasing, and that I would not be paying the $50. Tessa said she could not return the books because they came from the thrift store. I stood firm in my decision and reiterated that she should have asked me first. Tessa left and Ruby is very upset. I know Tessa is a student and does not have a ton of money, so am I the jerk for not paying Tessa for the books? Edit, because some people are asking. I am a single parent to Ruby, and while $50 will not make or break the bank, it is definitely an unexpected expense. I provide Tessa with an extra amount of money each month to spend on whatever she wants to do with Ruby, movies, the mall, etc. If she wanted to spend this fund on books for Ruby, that would have been totally fine, but she had already used it up. Edit 2. I definitely didn't expect this post to blow up overnight, so I'm going to add a bit more context. For those of you who are asking how can I afford a nanny for Ruby and still have $50 be a large unexpected expense, I do not pay for Tessa's services. Because Ruby is on the spectrum, she is entitled to benefits from our state, including care. The agency I work with pays Tessa. I'm not involved in that process at all. Update. I appreciate everyone's input. I've seen a few comments hinting to me about the fact that I don't support my daughter's reading habit. Please know this is definitely not the case. We're both big readers and frequent patrons of our local library. I'm always supportive of Ruby getting new books. I talked to Tessa and told her that I appreciate her for thinking of Ruby, apologized for the misunderstanding, and I have paid her for the books. We had a chat about expectations in the future, and I don't think this will happen again. I've also talked to Ruby, and we agreed that I would hold on to the books and she would pay me for them as she wishes. It's important to me that Ruby learns how to handle her finances appropriately, and we've decided that she will get two new books every week. She reads very quickly. After reading through your perspectives on the matter, I agree that it is better in the long run to lose the money and salvage the relationship between the three of us, and had not considered all of the implications of doing otherwise. Lesson learned. Sometimes it's better to salvage an important relationship than to be right. Pay for the books. Let Tessa know that you can't do so in the future though, without talking about it. Tell her how much you appreciate her thoughtfulness, now and always. Daughter keeps using Do Not Disturb on her phone to ignore us. My daughter, who's 16, has her phone on Do Not Disturb all of the time. At first, it wasn't an issue since she would still answer my texts and calls whenever she is out at practice. For the past few weeks, she stopped answering my texts and calls and she wouldn't receive them since I'd ask her why she wasn't answering and she'd claim that she didn't get them. I'm not stupid. Her phone is on do not disturb and none of my texts and calls are going through. I'd ask my other daughters to see if they can reach out to her whenever she is out just to ask her what time she might be home. No answers. My oldest, who's 22, would try to call, text, FaceTime, you name it, in order to ask her when she might be home. Over the weekend, my daughter had to attend an event at school, and when I came to pick her up, she went MIA and wasn't answering any of my texts and calls since again, the Do Not Disturb feature was on. I started to get frustrated over it, so when my daughter finally entered the car, I told her that she needs to start answering my calls and texts, and she had no reason to ignore me when she knew I was going to be picking her up. My daughter gave me the excuse of, oh, I didn't see it, again. 
My frustration turned into anger, so I start yelling at her and said, None of us are able to easily get a hold of you. Something that normally takes two minutes takes 20 or more since we can't seem to get you to answer the phone. Your father and I have been worried sick whenever you don't answer the phone. I then told her she has two choices. Either she removes the do not disturb on her phone or it gets taken away for a week. My daughter rolls her eyes and said it isn't fair for her to not be allowed to have the do not disturb feature on. I said she needs to start answering her phone or at the very least call us back right away. I said that if she doesn't comply, her phone will be taken away. She begged me not to take her phone, so I said she needs to remove the do not disturb feature. She refused once again. When we got home, I told her if she doesn't want her phone to be taken away, she needs to remove the do not disturb feature. After some back and forth, my daughter removes the feature right in front of me before running to her room in tears. Now, before anyone thinks otherwise, I did allow her to have the phone on do not disturb as long as she answers our calls and texts. We'd have to call her more than once to get a hold of her, but she is completely unreachable. I think I was too harsh, but I was at my wit's end. Am I the jerk? Edit. Some of you are thinking that I'm spamming my daughter with phone calls and texts while she's at school. I do not message her during school hours. The issue is taking place after school or on the weekends. My daughter, most of the time, does not tell anyone where she's going, doesn't ask for permission when she wants to go out with friends, and would sneak out of the house every time her father and I are out. None of my other kids would have any knowledge of where she went, and they'd even asked her, but she wouldn't answer her phone. Sometimes my son will ask her if she could buy him something from McDonald's or if they can go to Target together. We did speak to her before and said she can keep her phone on Do Not Disturb and we would never call or text while she's in class. Edit 2. My daughter has also been lying to us about where she'd go. She'd ask to borrow the car to go get food, but would come home two hours later. I'd call her after 45 minutes, but the phone would go straight to voicemail. She normally does tell us if she's going to class or practice, but whenever she goes out outside of those times, she doesn't tell us, she won't answer her phone. It's like she's hiding. Edit 3. Some are suggesting that I take the car keys away. The problem with that is, if there's a car available, she'll take it. She's taken my oldest daughter's car a few times, and when she'd ask where she's going, she would say, none of your business. My oldest hid the car keys from her, and it would be met with manipulation and my daughter crying and screaming. Edit 4. As stated in the first edit, we do not text or call our daughter during school. My daughter takes the car when my husband and I are not here. If there's no car available, she won't go. My daughter is on spring break this week and I've spoken to her this morning and I've taken her car keys. She will not have it back for a long time is all I'm going to say. Not until my husband and I are able to trust her again. My husband and I will have a serious sit down with her when he gets off from work this afternoon. Not the jerk. A teenager has the phone to be contacted. If she can't use it for its intended function, she doesn't need it. The do not disturb function can be set up such that a priority contact will go right through it. She's choosing not to. Not the jerk. As a parent, this is infuriating. My kids used to do it. There are situations where the do not disturb function is perfectly acceptable and it has its place. But you're paying the bill for that phone. She has a phone out of your kindness as a parent and she has no right to have a phone. You have every right to insist she takes it off do not disturb. Edit. Wow, so many, you're the jerks. Parents get phones for their kid to have some independence and to connect to the world. This parent was not overbearing and spamming the kid with phone calls. When a parent needs to reach their kid, they should be able to reach them. If they miss a text or a call, it's understandable. It happens. This kid was never answering. Repeat, never. The price the kid pays to have the phone is simply be accessible. They get all the benefits of being connected to the entire world, their friends, their entire family, the internet, social media, apps, games, all for the low price of zero dollars and responding to mom and dad when they call or text. Totally fair. You're the jerk. You have a teenager who's hiding something from you, sneaking out, stealing cars, and you're focused on her not answering the phone? I'm all for teenage independence, but this is way too far. Sort out your kid. I'm going against the grain, but you're the jerk. Not for forcing her to turn off the do not disturb feature on her phone, but for letting her think the way that she's acting is okay. Your 16-year-old daughter doesn't think it's necessary to let you guys know where she's going. She sneaks out of the house any given chance and she steals people's cars. She's not borrowing someone's car, she's stealing. And you're teaching her that she can get away with it. You're threatening her with taking her phone away? 
It should have been taken away a long time ago. You say you can't take the car keys away from her because she'll just steal whoever else's car is there? So you shouldn't even bother coming up with a solution? You're raising a kid that's going to be horrendous to deal with in the real world. Someone who doesn't respect boundaries and can't follow rules. This is far beyond the scope of Reddit. She might need to see a therapist. But in reality, it sounds like you guys aren't enforcing boundaries and your daughter has realized she can step all over you. Some kids need a strict parent and your daughter sounds like one of them. Kids nowadays are becoming a horror to deal with, especially in schools, because parents like you allow them to run the household. Put your foot down, she's your kid and you're the parent. Stop letting her put herself at risk because one day she's gonna make a mistake she can't come back from. Am I the jerk for giving away an expensive KitchenAid stand mixer my dad got me for my birthday that I thought looked extremely ugly? Background For my 24th birthday, my dad got me a gray metal KitchenAid stand mixer for my apartment. It was about $700, I think. However, I did not ask for this, and honestly, I hate the color as it doesn't match anything in my place, and also it's too big. I gave it to my friend who liked it and was moving to a different state. My boyfriend then got me a cute black stand mixer that fits into my apartment a lot better, so that's what I have. My dad was over last night and he noticed that the gray stand mixer was gone and replaced by the black one. He asked where it was and I told him the truth, namely that I thought the gray one was ugly, so I gave it to my friend and my boyfriend got me the black one instead. My dad was shocked and said the gray stand mixer had cost a lot and that he thought I would have liked it, so that's why he gave it to me as a present. Maybe here's where I'm the jerk. I said if he would have been more observant, he would have known that I absolutely hate the color gray. It's my least favorite color, and everyone in my life who knows me knows that. I honestly wasn't trying to be rude, I was just stating a fact. But my mom called me today and told me I really hurt my dad's feelings and I need to apologize for throwing away a thoughtful birthday gift my dad had put a lot of money and thought into. I don't think that's necessary. I think after my dad gave me the stand mixer, it became mine and I could do anything with it. And I didn't throw it away. I gave it to a friend. Am I the jerk? Not the jerk. Once you've given someone a gift, they don't get to claim ownership of that item anymore. A gift is given away, and that's kind of it. It's totally up to the receiver what they then do with it. Or at least that's how I treat gifts. Once it's gone from my responsibility of getting it to its receiver, then that's it. My job is done, and I don't care what happens to it. The money is gone from my pocket, and I move on. Whether someone likes my gift or not, I don't really care. Like, I try to make them as thoughtful as possible, but ultimately, I did my best, and that will have to do. Gifts aren't meant to be a way to control someone else or their actions. Gifts are meant to be gifted and enjoyed if possible. Sometimes the gifts we receive aren't that great, and we re-gift them or sell them or ask to get the monetary value of the gift, hence a gift receipt. I wonder if this whole thing has a lot less to do with the mixer itself and more to do with the fact that your dad maybe doesn't know anything about you or your living situation, or maybe doesn't listen to you when you talk about these things. Like with a high value item like that, I would normally ask the person their favorite color or needs, or ask them to pick the one that they want because everyone has different needs, aesthetics, preferences, and availability. It's an awkward situation because it is a high value item, and tons of people, including myself, would love to have one, but ultimately it's gone to a good home. OP has a mixer they like, and the dad still gave a very nice gift. And that effort doesn't mean nothing just because OP doesn't like it. I'm sure the effort put in is appreciated. I guess OP is just kind of fed up with the thoughtlessness of their dad not even asking them what they want, which is kind of valid because furnishing a home is very much a personal thing. It's a part of your personal space, so I get where OP is coming from. I don't think the dad is a jerk either. I just think everyone here has to communicate more effectively. OP would be better to let their dad know that the mixer wasn't for them, but they appreciate the effort. Am I the jerk for not doing anything hostessy for my in-laws visit, given I'm three weeks postpartum? My husband's family lives on the other side of the country. We had our first kid at the height of lockdown, so my husband's parents, sister, and her family did not meet him in person until his first birthday. I just delivered our second two weeks ago, and my husband's family, four adults and three kids, asked if they could all visit during spring break to see the baby which is the end of next week. I said okay. Although the seven of them would be staying at an Airbnb, I know they will be spending all day every day at our home to see the kids. I told my husband to make sure they know we will be ordering in every meal. And beyond eggs and cereal and some drinks and snacks, like chips and fruit, I wasn't planning to get much else. 
I'm also tired and up with the baby all night, and I'm exhausted at the very thought of seven people being in my house every day for a week while I'm trying to nurse and rest and manage a toddler's big emotions around a new sibling. His response was, Well, we're going to need X and Y for my parents and X for the kids, and I was thinking one day I can make X. And he started describing needing to get the best bread and the best cheese, all of which involves trips to numerous stores. He even said he was going to ask my dad, who occasionally buys us some specialty grocery stuff that I ask for and drops it off, to pick up a bunch of items for them. At this point, I got really mad. I said, I'm not trying to go above and beyond here and play host while I'm three weeks postpartum. They can eat this stuff from the grocery store, even if it's not the best, and deal for five days. He told me I sound spiteful. I was also frustrated because when his family visits, my husband checks out and just plays with his nephews and chats for hours with his brother-in-law. And I know I'm going to be the one setting out snacks, tidying up, etc. He seems more concerned with his family having fun, the visit being a good time and with them being comfortable than with me getting what I need. I feel like it doesn't matter what I ask for. He isn't going to have my back, so I have to protect myself and my own well-being. We got into a big fight about it. I yelled at him, and I'm not really talking to him right now. They show up next week, and I'm feeling a lot of anger and resentment about it. So, am I the jerk for not lifting a finger for my visitors? Not the jerk. OMG, they should be helping you. Not the jerk. Tell him division of labor is that you take care of the baby and he takes care of the house and guests. If he refuses, offer to switch. He can do all the feeding and changing and lose sleep every night. No? Then he can take care of the house and the guests. Not the jerk. If your husband wants to have his family entertained, then he has to entertain them. That means cooking for them, serving them, and cleaning up after them. Am I the jerk for kicking my son out for how he treated his mom? I, 53 female, and my wife, Abby, who's 50 female, have been together for over 30 years and married for 20. We adopted our son, Jack, when he was a toddler after his parents had passed. He's now 20. Bringing him up wasn't without its difficulties, but in all, he was a good kid. Good grades, good judgment, didn't cause trouble on purpose. He always loved spending time with us, watching TV with us, and in his teen years, he even began cooking with us and became somewhat of a Gordon Ramsay. I noticed things changed a bit after we adopted our daughter at the age of seven, Sam. He was 15. She was a troubled kid, bounced around a lot in the foster care system. For a while, he loved her and really enjoyed being around her and showing her that this house was safe, which was basically all the things my wife and I were trying to do. I wanted to be clear that we never asked him to be a parent. That was our job. He always offered to do things with her and would often choose to be around her rather than his friends. He never had to babysit her, but he did on occasion during small emergencies. He seemed slightly annoyed with her, but always told us that it was just a bit frustrating to deal with her sometimes. For info, when I say Sam was troubled, I mean she'd hide food, hide herself, and shut down a lot. There was no violence or anger. We still deal with the echoes of some of this today. We do have her in therapy to this day, and she's much better. Soon after his 19th birthday, he met a girl, who was 18 at the time, and his personality began to change. He grew resentful of us, of Sam. He'd make these weird or hostile comments towards Abby or me, and occasionally I'd catch him telling Sam about her biological family. I'd always try to shut it down, but he'd make some excuse and go home when I tried to talk to him. I don't want Sam getting into contact with her family. It's a toxic family that was no good and very dangerous. Earlier today, me and the wife were speaking to him about his behavior, and he said that his girlfriend told us that we kept him from his family on purpose during his entire upbringing and that adoption was a bad experience that tears families apart. This stunned us since we were always as transparent as we could be. What remained of his family didn't want to talk to him and that's why we adopted him. My wife tried to explain that we never tried to do that. He called her a lying jerk and told her to shut up and that we are baby snatchers. Immediately I cut in and told him to leave and not come back unless it's to apologize. He left saying that he hoped one day Sam wisened up to us lying about her family as well, that we were awful for ripping her away from her real family. I don't understand his logic, but he was clearly upset at us for what we did. I wish I hadn't kicked him out so he could have talked it through, but he was just throwing mistreatment to us, the ones who actually cared for him for most of his life, and I couldn't watch it. Am I the jerk?
Nope, not the jerk. It sounds like you've been saying and doing all the right things where both kids are concerned. Also, by age 20, he should have much better control over his actions and words. He had no right to talk to you like this. By the age of 6, I knew better than to talk to my parents that way. I don't think you should backtrack at all on the ultimatum. If he gets in touch, you can be relieved or happy, etc. But stay firm on your rule. He still has to apologize and it has to be heartfelt. No throwaway stuff like, all right, all right, I'm sorry. He needs to know why he's sorry and the apology should reflect this. Also, something else might be going on with him. Not an excuse, but maybe an explanation. Am I the jerk for telling my daughter she can't move 1,000 miles away to live with her girlfriend? I, 46 female, am the mother to two wonderful kids, Andrew, who's 16, and Nicole, who's 21. Nicole was very bright as a kid and excelled in her classes, and she headed into college with a plan to get a master's at least. I never had to worry about her doing well or hitting milestones, but the last few years have been very surprising. She became a bit withdrawn in her teen years, more so than I realized until now, and after her first year of college, she suddenly moved out from a relative's home and got her own apartment. Then after her second year of college, last May, she told me and her father, who's 58, that she was dropping out and might return in a year, but wasn't sure, and that she was incredibly stressed and depressed and had been for years. It felt like it was coming out of nowhere. Last fall, she got a full-time job and started talking about how she was happy and finally in a good routine and that she loved working. I was glad things were at least going well for her now, but still hoping she'd return to college soon. One of the biggest recent bombshells she dropped on me, though, was a month ago when I drove to visit her. We went out for lunch and we started talking about this friend, 25, female, of hers. Eventually, my daughter admitted to me that she and this girl had been dating since January and that she flew to meet her without even telling me or her father. Mind you, she flew over 1,000 miles to see this girl that she had never even met and had only called and video chatted with for a few months. I was shocked and angry, but all I did was gently scold her for not telling me and that I'm glad she's okay and that she had a good time with her girlfriend. I'm very new to this whole thing with my daughter, but I'm willing to support her because I love her. The problem now is that she told me earlier this week that she intends to move within the next year and a half. She says it may be sooner rather than later because things are changing with her girlfriend's living situation and she wanted to give me a heads up. I told her absolutely not, that she can't move in with someone she's only been dating for a couple of months, especially not when she's moving several states away. All of her family is here, including me and her father and her brother and her three living grandparents. I told her she's too young and she can't move that far away from us just for a girl. She told me that regardless of her girlfriend, she's been wanting to move away for years and that her girlfriend's state was on a list of potential places. She said she loved being there when she visited and can't wait to go back. She says I'm being unreasonable by asking her to stay and that she hates it here and feels like she can't be herself. Am I the jerk here? I don't think she's old enough or mature enough to leave. Edit because someone asked. My daughter didn't ask for money. She almost never asks for money. She's like her father in that way. She's almost completely financially independent. I have her on my health and dental insurance to help her out. My mother pays for her monthly phone plan because she insisted on doing something for my daughter. And my daughter's grandfather on her father's side pays her car insurance. And my daughter goes to her father when she has car troubles because he has a lot of experience with cars. My daughter takes care of all of her other needs on her own. You're the jerk. It seems like you don't know much about your daughter's personal life, and that's okay, because she doesn't need to share. She's not a teen living under your roof. The more you butt in and tell her what she can and can't do as an adult, the less you're going to see her. Have you considered that the reason she wants to leave at all is to get away from the restraints of her hometown and family? You're the jerk. She's an adult, and she has respected you enough to tell you. It's a shame that you weren't close enough to get to see that she was depressed when you thought she was all good, but keeping her close won't make up for that. Fully embrace and support her because it sounds like she's happy. Stay on her good side and hopefully she'll bring you along in her new life. My Karen stepdaughter scammed me for $10,000. Fake names for privacy. I have three kids, Bea, 23 female, Amy, 20 female, and Liz, 15 female. Bea is technically my stepdaughter and I only mention it because it's relevant to the story. My husband Ben and I have a deal with our kids that as long as they are studying, we will pay for all their expenses 
and they may be at home rent-free. If they feel that college isn't for them, then they need to get a job. We feel it's their life and their choice, but Ben and I won't enable them to do nothing. Amy is earning a degree, and Liz is still in high school. Bea told us that college wasn't for her. We said okay and helped her apply for jobs. She got hired as a receptionist, but only works part-time. We just asked that she pitch in for groceries under $75 a month and help with chores. She was not charged for her room or for water or electric bills. We also paid for her car and its insurance. They only had to pay for gas. She also has all of her essentials, soap, toothpaste, etc. provided by us. She needs to follow the house rules. Be kind and respectful to every member of the house. You may stay up past 10 p.m., but must be quiet since other people have work or school. Turn off devices you aren't using to conserve electricity and improve the Wi-Fi. We don't approve of smoking, but if you're going to do it, you have to do it outside and dispose of it properly, etc. Ben and I always believed that our rules were fair and reasonable. That was all the background. Here's the reason I'm posting. In January, Bea approached us, explaining that our occupational center was offering courses, and she wanted to take them so she could become certified and get a better paying job. The tuition for the course, plus extra fees because of books and other required supplies, would come out to over $10,000. Ben and I wrote her a check because, as I said, we will help all of our kids with their education. We asked about two weeks ago if she would be having a graduation ceremony, and Bea replied that she didn't know. Ben and I called the occupational center to ask so we could make sure to get the day off work. We asked for three different workers who all confirmed that the course Bea claimed to have been enrolled in hadn't been offered at that center for years. We do more digging and discover that Bea had gambled away most of the money and spent the rest on things that go against our rules. Needless to say, we were livid with her. We couldn't believe that she would lie and betray our trust like that. We told Bea that we had expected all the money paid back by the end of the year and for her to pay us a $400 monthly rent. If not, she's out of the house. Time to grow up, be an adult, and take accountability. Bea's biological mom, Zoe, is calling me a jerk and trying to make it seem as if I'm the wicked stepmother and just hate Bea. She's saying things like I've turned Ben against Bea and Bea can't do anything fun anymore because of the rent rule. Ben and I feel Bea needs some serious boundaries, but Zoe's words have made me doubt myself. Am I the jerk? Not the jerk. You know you're never going to see that money, right? Bea lied to you to keep living rent-free, and she scammed you out of $10,000 on top of that. I'd kick her out right now, not wait nine months for her to cause more mischief. By the way, in the future, pay the tuition, residence, books, etc. bills directly rather than cutting the student a check. Well, who do you think is the jerk, OP or Bea? Please let us know. If biological mom has such a strong opinion, maybe Bea should move in with her. My wife thinks she's an actual princess. I gave her a reality check. For the past several months, my wife has been acting eerily like a kid. I understand that she's playing with our daughter, but it comes across as weird to me to the degree that she plays the role. Our daughter wanted a mini pizza, and so she asked me if I'd make her one. I was, and then my wife said, Me too. I'm a princess too. I told her, No, you're an adult, not a princess. I'll make you one but you're an adult. She laughed nervously and said, Okay, never mind. Our daughter heard and said, Dad, Mom is a princess too. I just said, Mm-hmm, agreeing, but I didn't want to have to explain it to her. I did feel bad because my wife changed out of her princess clothes too, but I don't know whether this whole ordeal makes me the jerk. You're the jerk. They're just having fun playing together. Why don't you call yourself a prince and join in? I bet your daughter would love that. Also, princesses can be adults. They don't automatically become queens when they get older. If you look at a list of current princesses in the UK, there's one that's 86 years old. Not the jerk. Your wife is delusional if she thinks she's a princess, but it could be mental health related. Does she have a therapist that she sees regularly? Sometimes adults can act out imaginary roles as a coping mechanism for past issues. I definitely see about getting her something that can help control this sort of thing but only a doctor can tell you what she really needs. You're the jerk. Kids were playing pirate one day and wanted us to play too. So we did, for an entire evening. We had a lot of playtime like that. Impromptu candlelight dinners when they played dress up. 
burping contests. Yes, gross, but silly. Some of our best family memories. Kids are experts in how to have fun. Let them help you remember how to laugh. Not the jerk. All of these people claiming how important it is that you play dress up with your kids have no idea what they're talking about. That's how you create entitled kids who literally think they're princes and princesses. My parents never did any of that crap with me, and as a result, I'm a normal functioning human being who never felt entitled to anything. I have three kids myself now, and I would never do any of that stuff with them. If they want to have fun, we have educational games they can play. My youngest is particularly fond of Elmo, so just about every day she plays Elmo's reading and Elmo's numbers. My oldest two both try to watch that Coco Melon crap, and my wife would try to let them. That's when I had to lay down the law, and I straight up told her that if I caught them watching Coco Melon one more time, I'd divorce her in a heartbeat and get full custody. I'm a lawyer who deals with custody cases every day. She knows she wouldn't stand a chance. Guess what? Since then, I've never seen them watching that crap again. I'll be darned if I'm going to let my kids watch this new trash that's literally designed to rot their brains so they'll grow into non-functioning NPC adults the way the politicians want them to be. Edit. Oh, you let your kids watch Coco Melon all day and you think that makes it okay? Let's see where your kids are at in life 20 years from now compared to mine. You suckers. Am I the jerk for locking my sister and her brats out of my room? To make a long story short, my sister, who's 32, and I, 26 female, ended up moving back home at the same time due to lockdown. I am work from home and she lost her job. Because she has three kids, she made a big stink to keep the entire second floor to her and her kids. I got stuck with the creepy, musky basement because of her. Only, it turned out to be a dream. I'm very introverted and nobody wanted to go down to the creepy, unfinished, spider-infested basement, so it worked. I spent every month since trying to finish the basement. I finished the floor with epoxy, fixed the water heater on my own dime, got a split unit for heating and cooling, exterminated. Then I installed some nice track lighting, got a mini fridge and foosball table. Now it's my own personal clubhouse. Until recently, when I noticed someone was stealing my energy drinks and messing with my game consoles. Nobody confessed, so I bought a lock and a key for both doors, gave my dad the only spare, it's his house, and locked up on Thursday so I could go to an office meeting. That's when we found out it was my nephew because he left his stuffed toy in there and apparently whined all day until my dad got home and let him in. Now my sister is raising heck about how I shouldn't get so much space to myself since I don't have kids, that I don't pay enough rent to justify it, that nothing in this arrangement is fair and she's demanding that I leave the space open as a family room. That was not the arrangement though. The basement is my room and I'm the one who spent all that time and money fixing it. Nobody wanted to be there until I was finished with it. Things got heated and I called her kid a filthy brat because he is. He gets mud everywhere, never washes his hands, and he's broken just about every console she's ever gotten the kids. And now she wants me kicked out of the house. Am I the jerk? Quick update. So after we all cooled down, I did talk to my father. He said he has zero interest in letting the kids go down there. When my sister tried to protest, he pointed out to her that the place is still not safe for kids. There are still rat traps, exposed wood. He pointed out that she herself kept screaming about there being mold. There isn't. So he doesn't want any of the kids going in there. And unless she's willing to pay for an inspector to check, she's not. She has no say. So that shut her up really quick. Then she got into it with me for the filthy brat comment. And I was about to apologize because I was heated. It was messed up. Only dad hopped in at that moment and chose to have a serious conversation with her about the youngest not washing his hands. He apparently ruined several leftovers in the fridge last week and slimed the butter. I don't know. I don't want to know. Which my dad did want to bring up anyway. Because the kid has a problem and won't bathe. But I stepped out at that point because it sounded like he was mad. Very few things make my dad mad than having to throw away perfectly good food. It's one of his triggers. So everything is shaping in my way for now. Not the jerk. You had an arrangement. She got the second floor, you got the basement. The lock is a great idea and I love it. Don't engage in the argument. It's not her house, it's your dad's. So as long as your dad isn't asking for you to leave, just go gray rock over her complaints. Don't fight, just ensure you're good with your dad and ignore her. Maybe consider keeping the door locked when you're there too, if she's gonna raise a fuss.
Sister loves to roast my husband. He expects me to defend him. My husband, 31 male, and I, 30 female, have been married for three years. About four months ago, we found out that I was pregnant with our first baby. We were overjoyed and told most of our family about it early on. My husband didn't want to reveal it to our friends yet, and so I didn't. It was incredibly hard for me, especially because I couldn't tell JJ, 30 female. JJ and I have been best friends since we were 14. I love her so much, and we tell each other every single thing. But I decided to respect my husband's wishes this time. JJ also moved three hours away from us earlier this year, so she doesn't visit as much either. Naturally, over the past month, more and more of our friends have gotten to know about it. But I couldn't find the right time to tell JJ, and my husband didn't insist much either. Yesterday, JJ visited us, and I revealed the pregnancy through a small box that said, You're an auntie now, with a baby onesie. Now JJ's a little goofy, which is what I love the most about her. She doesn't care what others think and is just a very entertaining person in general. When she saw the text, she immediately started screaming and then cried and hugged me. It was a very emotional moment for both of us. My husband seemed pretty happy about it too, although he's known to not adore JJ's amusing behavior sometimes. She's a huge jokester and she loves to roast him. After the reveal, she gave him a big hug, then a pat on the back and said, Darn, Mike, didn't know you could do that. This was clearly a joke, and everyone in the room let out a laugh. My husband was not very happy. He responded with, You know, this is why you were the last one to know about this, in a very passive-aggressive tone. JJ was taken aback and confused. She asked me if that was true, and when I responded with an explanation, she said she was kind of hurt, but was happy for us. The excitement died down in the room after that, and everybody left soon after. I got really mad at my husband for saying that to JJ, but he says that he's tired of her cracking jokes and not taking things seriously. And most of all, he hates that I never take his side. Knowing JJ, she's really just kidding most of the time, and I don't think there's anything to be that offended over. My husband thinks I'm being a jerk here by not defending him. What do y'all think? Am I the jerk? She's a huge jokester and loves to roast him? And I'm assuming your husband has expressed his displeasure at this behavior in the past. It doesn't matter if JJ likes to roast him. If he doesn't also like it, and he clearly doesn't, then it isn't roasting, it's bullying. And like many who have been bullied continuously, he had finally had enough and clapped back. Was it mean? Yes, but so was her bullying. If you don't have the awareness to see how her bullying affects your husband, that's a you problem, and you don't get to blame him when he stands up for himself. You're the jerk, and you need to talk to JJ about her bullying him. After you have a serious look at how you've helped enable this behavior for years and apologize to your husband about it. Everyone sucks here. You and your friend, not your husband. It sounds like she likes to roast him and he doesn't like it. That's not entertaining behavior. This probably isn't the first time he's reacted to one of her roasts and it's probably not the first time he's talked to you about it. He says he's tired of this. If she doesn't take him seriously, why wouldn't you step up and say something to her? You say she doesn't care what others think. She should care what your husband thinks about what she says to him. You should too. Am I the jerk for suing my girlfriend after she had my 1967 Impala taken to the scrapyard? I'll try to keep this short. I had a 1967 Impala four-door that I bought in February 2019. A couple months ago, I bought my first house that had a two-and-a-half car garage. I moved the car in and started tearing it down for a complete restoration. I had the body in one bay and the chassis in another, plus the whole garage filled with parts. About two months ago, my girlfriend came to live with me, and the whole time she's hated that car. She wants to park in the garage, but I have two acres of land with a lot of nice places to park under shady trees or even in the barn if it has to be inside. I tell her tough luck, it's my house and it's not like I can just throw it back together real quick. Anyways, I was out of town for a couple days on a business trip for the small local company I work for. When I got back, my girlfriend was all smiles, making me food all the time, doing all the chores, all of that. I thought maybe she was just happy to have me home, but then I realized that I didn't see her car in its usual spot. I asked her where she parked so I could make sure I mow that area and keep it clean, and she said not to worry because she parked in the garage. I asked how, and she told me to go check it out. Turns out that while I was gone, she hired some people to come over and move everything related to that car, including the drivetrain, body, and chassis, and all parts, and take it to the local dump and scrapyard. 
I was absolutely dumbfounded. I had spent over $11,000 on that car, including new parts, services, and the car itself. I told her that I was going to be taking her to court for that, and she brushed me off like I was being dramatic. I told her that it's done between us and to pack her things and leave. I admit I was really angry, but I did end up getting a lawyer, and as I have all the receipts for all of the money I spend, and I have her on my house security cam footage letting the guys in and watching them take it all, I think I can win. Her family and friends are absolutely blowing me up, saying it's just a stupid old piece of junk and that she cannot pay back all that money I spent and that I should just let it go. But I've been putting all of my time, effort, and money into that car for a year and a half now, and I'm going to get justice for what she did. Am I the jerk? Edit, thank you so much for the support. I'm glad I have some people on my side. I got a call from her mom about 20 minutes ago, and she told me that I was ruining her daughter's life over a stupid car. I told her that she ruined her own life. I've been gathering documentation, and I'm about to head down to the police station and file a report, as suggested by a lot of you here. Once again, thank you all. Update. Went to the police station last night, was told to come back in the morning. Just got back and filed an official report against her for grand larceny and grand theft auto. I showed them all of the receipts that I had for the car and the footage of her letting the guys come and take it, as well as the title for the vehicle in my name. They said that they will be in contact with all three parties, me, ex-girlfriend, and the junkyard guys, soon, and they hopefully will be able to recover some or all of the car. Just have to wait now. Huge update. They found my car. The junkyard guys apparently were in the middle of hiding it when the police came to ask them questions. It was on a forklift, and they were going to put it on top of a pile of cars that was hidden behind more piles of cars. They said it was theirs and that they had the title, but obviously didn't have the title for it. And since they matched the VIN on the chassis and body to the VIN on my title, it was obviously mine. I know at least one person there has been arrested. I think he was on the camera footage I talked about earlier, but I don't know if it was the boss or whomever, or even his specific charge. They also told me that they would be looking into the specific junkyard for any other vehicles reported stolen. They said they haven't been able to get in contact with my ex just yet, but they're working on it. I'm just so glad they found my car. Luckily, I made quite an album of pictures detailing me tearing down the car, and so I can use that to prove what parts they had were mine, so I can hopefully get most or all of it back. Police haven't let me take it back home yet, as they say it's evidence or something, so hopefully I can get it back eventually. Thank you all so much for the support and advice. She's gonna be alright. Not the jerk. Sue her. Sue her for the cost, plus a few extra thousand for the time and money. Have her prosecuted for theft, destruction of private property, and have the guys that came to get it prosecuted for receiving stolen goods. Nail them all to the wall. So you want us to adhere to the company hierarchy? Sure. So I work as a mechanic in a sewage treatment plant. It's a very laid back job. In fact, three out of eight hours was spent not working. I know that it sounds like we're a bunch of freeloaders, but it's just because the tasks we perform are simple and we do our best to do them ASAP. Anyway, the hierarchy in our plant is quite complicated, but the most important thing is that as a part of a mechanical department, our only supervisor on site is our master. At least I think that's the English translation. Both plant manager and plant master are not our supervisors, yet they, as well as other workers, asked us to carry out some jobs for them, which we gladly agreed to do even despite most of them being out of our range of duty. You know, welding racks back together, installing a new faucet, etc. Most of the time, we weren't doing anything else anyway, but sometimes we were preoccupied with our own tasks. Still, the plant master always told us that his tasks were more important and to just leave what we were doing for some other day. Due to this, many of our old tasks were left for another day, which because of constant requests were left sitting for months. Still, it was always his jobs that had the priority. Now is the right time to address the tense situation we had with the plant master. He's best buddies with the manager, usually blaming all of the shortcomings of his team on us. Stuff like something not being cleaned, stuff that's not a mechanical failure, stuff that's simply not important enough, or stuff that's beyond our competencies and should be taken care of by a specialist company. He also had this very annoying habit of rummaging through our tools, taking parts and using our machinery without asking. It's very annoying, but whatever. It's important to keep good relationships and work. But then he dropped the bomb. He had the list of all of our old tasks that were left unfinished. The list that wasn't that long, by the way. About eight things. 
three of which were outside of our competencies, and said that our manager and CEO will be waiting in the conference room to give us a lecture and to take away our bonuses. The meeting went very roughly. It started with the CEO saying, you can say goodbye to your bonus this month, then proceeded to give us a lecture about the importance of our tasks. Then he kept blabbering about us threatening our master, plant master being the only supposed witness, etc. When the CEO was talking about possible solutions, the plant master did the worst calculation of his life. He proposed adhering to the company's structure and proper workflow. Well, we didn't want to oppose since we knew what that meant. We talked this over with our master. Now every time the plant manager slash master wants us to do something, we reply with, we don't take jobs in the corridors. We have our jobs to do. Sorry, we can't afford to leave what we're doing. We have it planned for today. Or does our master know about this? We can't do anything without him ordering it to be done. By now, no one has been to our workshop for four weeks. No extra jobs, no side jobs, nothing. Only two tasks a day that usually take 30 minutes each with a team of five. And it's all by the books. We definitely respect the company structure and have a proper workflow, focusing on our tasks. P.S. Most of the backlogs were also due to stuff breaking down, which is mostly due to a faulty infrastructure. Most of the pipes are clogged with sedimentation and require thorough cleaning and rebuilding. But I guess it's cheaper to simply replace a pump which had to push the same amount of sewage through pipes that have narrowed by two times at this point. Those poor pumps. And yeah, the pipework and technology is the responsibility of the plant master and plant manager. Am I the jerk for wanting to keep the money my grandmother left me in her estate and not give it to my parents? My grandmother passed, leaving her estate to her two sons, my dad's brothers, and my brother, 23 male, and I. My dad had estranged my grandmother for the last 15 years of her life, but my brother and I maintained a relationship with her. In her will, she specifically noted that she was giving the share of her estate that would have otherwise gone to my father, to my brother and I, divided in two. My parents have been extremely adamant that this money is theirs, that my father should have never been written out of the will as the money was his birthright. My mother has told me that this money is the only thing that will give my dad his dignity back so that he is of equal value to his two brothers who received money. My grandmother wronged them, and from their perspective, she did this to get back at them. I've dealt with my uncles and the lawyers of the estate for the past two years, as all of this has unfolded. I maintained a relationship with my grandmother up until her last day. I visited her while she was in palliative care. My father did not. He sent a text message to her through my cell phone during her last week. My father and mother have cut me off from the rest of my extended family, both on my dad's side and my mom's side, all for reasons I still don't entirely understand as I was very young when it happened. They've told me a bit about why this happened, but it's been very surface level. They say it was because the family judged them beyond reasons that were repairable. When speaking to my parents about wanting to give them some money, but keep some for my future and to help me pay off my student loans, they responded by telling me that I'm not poor enough for this money. I don't eat craft dinner every night. I have a full-time job and my level of stress financially is incongruent with my spending habits. Also, that I have trouble seeing things from a different perspective, because if I understood why my dad needed this money to retain his dignity, I wouldn't be fighting this. They also desperately financially need this money. My dad is unemployed, and my mom only has her pension for them both. I'm worried my dad will cut me out if I don't just give him my entire share of the estate. My brother is scared of losing my parents, that he's just decided to give them the entirety of his share. I'm trying to stand my ground. I love my parents. I just want them to have some accountability for everything that's happened and that I maintained a relationship with my grandma and that means something. They're adamant that money is theirs and I'm only being given it because they allowed me to have a relationship with her and didn't cut me off from her. I feel guilty that I will not be maintaining my grandmother's wishes, but I also don't want to lose the only family I have left. Not the jerk. The idea your mom has that money equals dignity is totally materialistic BS mega nonsense. Your money is not your identity, and anyone that's unfortunate enough to think it is, they're deluded. Money is not dignity, money is not character. But that money is yours, legally, rightfully, and morally given by your grandmother. The rest of this BS is just a family squabble about status. Forget that. If your dad wanted to be included in the inheritance, he should have thought about how estranging your grandma would affect that before it was too late. 
Am I the jerk for rubbing in my family's face, my great life? My husband and I got married last weekend. I come from a very poor background and a huge family from a tiny town. We're close, even if I've always been the weird and different one, moving away, etc. Husband comes from a huge, more middle-class family. One of my favorite things to do is host and entertain. I think life can be hard and making people comfortable or showing them a great time is a really worthwhile thing. It's also fun for me, like a giant crafting project, to plan an event. I love it. My husband does very well and I've been lucky to have a great career and do the same. Our wedding was the only time likely for all of these people we both loved to be in the same place, to meet and celebrate together, so we wanted to make it special and magical. We were very clear that gifts were not necessary and I set aside a fund for my aunt and I to coordinate covering any expenses for people who wanted to come but couldn't afford the hotel, outfit, etc., but quietly. I know a huge wedding is a waste to many people, but it isn't to us. We did three days of events and covered meals and open bars for 300 people. We had a short performance, a big welcome party with a kind of carnival for the kids, gift bags for everyone, and lots of surprises. It was so fun to watch all the joy and everyone smiling and happy. Everything was optional. We shamed no one who came to only one part or couldn't swing it. At brunch the final day, my aunt pulled me aside and asked me to go to my cousin's room and console her. She said she had been sobbing all night and morning because her wedding in August would be nowhere near this level and she thought all our family would hate it and judge her. My heart broke. Every wedding I've been to with my family has been low key, maybe in a barn or a rec center, someone's backyard. No one has ever judged or looked down on this, nor would I, just different styles and we always have a great time. I left my guests at brunch and spent the better part of an hour with my cousin trying to assure her of all of the above. I told her a wedding is a celebration of love, not money, etc., and that we were all very excited. She finally got weirdly calm and stopped crying, then looked me dead in the eye and said something like, Well, you don't need to worry about it because you're not invited anymore, then locked herself in the bathroom. <laughs> I came back to brunch and most everyone was gone. I was crying but didn't want to make a scene and just got out as fast as possible. My husband keeps telling me to not take it to heart, but I hate that something we worked so hard to make fun and memorable for people ended up making someone I love feel terrible. And now my aunt, her mom, has started telling people that I just did this to rub in my family's face, my great fancy rich life, etc. I feel sick. I was so happy and proud and now I feel so stupid. Did I really mess this up that badly? Am I the jerk? First, congratulations. Second, not the jerk. A quote, no one can make you feel inferior without your permission. You had an amazing celebration. Please don't let one person spoil it. You will never be able to please everyone. You can't cater to everyone's desires. Do what works for you. Be humble and gracious, and it sounds like you did this well, so major props, and let the rest fall as it may. I don't have a ton of evidence to back this up, but part of me thinks that she slash they were hoping to guilt you into offering money towards your cousin's wedding. Her mother and her being so distressed about how her event wasn't going to be as fancy, emphasizing that she was worried about being judged for her less expensive options. It just feels like she may have been attempting to manipulate you into offering cash to make things fair. Then, when you didn't follow the script, she dropped the poor little me act, got mad and uninvited you. Now, to cover it all up, they're bad-mouthing you everywhere because painting you as selfish and nasty is a great way of covering up what they were trying to do. You're not the jerk. Either your cousin is hilariously oversensitive or they were up to something. Uninviting you because your event was nicer is such a massive overreaction. Not the jerk. This is why the greatest book ever written on getting rich, the author talks about how important it is that you disassociate yourself completely from anything and anyone having to do with poverty. They will not be happy for you and at best they will feign joy for your success. They will be jealous and expect you to hand over your wealth to them. They will talk about how you changed because you don't give them the things they expect from you. I grew up in the projects and built my own clothing line into a multi-million dollar enterprise and I learned early on that does money change people? Yes, but it's not always the one who makes the money that changes. It's the people around them that you need to watch out for. My own brother broke into my house and stole over $50,000 worth of my jewelry because I wouldn't pay his mortgage for him 
that I told him from the jump he never should have taken on. Now he's in prison off some other charges he caught, but even when he's getting out, I ain't gonna have nothing to do with his dumb self. I grinded hard for everything I have, and I'ma stay away from broke individuals until the day I die. Am I the jerk for firing the babysitter for being a bad influence? My wife and I hired a babysitter, Adeline, who's 18, for our kids, who are 8 months, 2, 4, 5, and 7, a few months ago. Adeline is great with our kids, and she's the only babysitter that can handle so many kids. A couple problems are that she's constantly late. It's usually no more than 5 minutes. She has been 10 and even 15 minutes late, however, but it's still irritating. Another thing is, after she gets everyone asleep, she spends the rest of the night on her phone or laptop. She never cleans up in the playroom because she claims it's always messy and she doesn't know where anything goes and will only clean up what she did with the kids. For example, Adeline did an art project with my older three kids and cleaned the counters and the floor after that art project, but she didn't pick up the toys that were in the living room or do the dishes. Another problem is that her outfits. I've asked my wife to talk to her about it, but she refused even though she admitted that she agreed about Adeline's clothes. My parents are in town and they wanted to take the kids on a walk. While on the walk, they saw Adeline on a run wearing an outfit that barely covered anything. Everyone saw her and my kids talked about it for days. My five-year-old has also been talking about how pretty she is and that he's going to marry her when he gets older, which is completely unacceptable. I decided to fire her because of the reasons I listed above. When I told my wife, she started screaming at me because she thinks Adeline is a great babysitter and is reasonably priced. I told her Adeline is a bad influence and I don't want her around my kids, but she's refusing to speak to me until I call Adeline back and offer her job back. She even wants me to offer her a raise if she says no. Am I the jerk for firing the babysitter for being a bad influence? I cannot stop laughing. So much you're the jerk. If you want someone to clean your home, that is a separate service for which you must appropriately pay. From what your wife said, you're already underpaying the babysitter, so I'm sure your wife is fine with her being a few minutes late. You're already getting a great bargain. I'm sorry you're such a lazy slob that you don't clean your own house. I'm thinking it's best for Adeline that she no longer works for you. You're clearly a creep and it's not safe for her there. Stepsister destroyed my books, gets her trip cancelled. I'm 16, female. My dad married my stepmom two years ago. She has a daughter who's 16 called Bianca. Bianca and I don't like each other. She thinks I'm a spoiled brat and that I have a princess complex because both my parents came from money and I always get what I want. This is by no means true at all. While my parents bought me lots of things, I have a part-time job and keep my grades up to earn everything I ask for. One of the things I love the most are books. Fantasy, romance, crime, mystery, I love them all. My mom and I share this hobby, so we're always buying books and reading them together. I also have a Nintendo Switch and a TV in my room. Aside from my laptop and my phone, those are my most prized possessions. My sister is always asking to borrow my things, clothes, makeup, my Switch, or my books. I let her use the first three because I don't really care, but when it comes to my books, I don't let anybody else have them. A few weeks ago, she came and asked me to take one or two because she saw the guy she likes reading The Seven Husbands of Evelyn Hugo, and I happen to have that book, though I've still yet to read it. I said no, and we had a discussion because I was so spoiled to share. She asked again by dinner, and I said no. Then she asked by breakfast and tried to get my dad and stepmom in. Both of them agreed with me. I sent her a few links of the book on discount, and I thought that was it. But three days ago, when I came back from my mom's house, I found seven of my books, including the one she wanted, ripped to pieces, some big chunks of my wallpaper missing, and a few posters on the floor all destroyed. It was no mystery. As soon as I told my dad and stepmom, they knew it was her and grounded her. She was supposed to go to LA in June for her birthday, but her mom said she wasn't going to be paying for it, and since her dad won't either, he's a deadbeat, then she'll pretty much just miss it, since some for the money will be mine to replace all the things she destroyed and the rest will be kept as punishment. She's now losing it on me and calling me every name under the sun because I ruined her trip and the guy has been talking to another girl. You know you're not the jerk. Your stepmom sounds awesome 
considering she's making her daughter face consequences for her behavior instead of enabling it. OP. I was confident I was not the jerk, but some of my friends said that I went too far for some books because I can always replace them and that it was not that big of a deal compared to her trip because that was for her birthday. No, they're wrong. It doesn't matter what the items were. That's irrelevant. She destroyed things that didn't belong to her and now she's facing the consequences. Karen Ant demands to live with me because she needs a caretaker. Growing up, my 23 female Ant, who's now 45 female, was child free in the sense that she actively wanted nothing to do with kids and she would avoid coming to events where kids would be there. She would tell my brother and I that kids were dirty and scream and annoy everyone until they learned to act like adults, which I guess isn't wrong, but still, it was hurtful for us to hear that as we were growing up. What I found the worst about my aunt was how she used to talk about my mom, her older sister. My mom has been single since my dad abandoned us for his affair partner. I've overheard my aunt commenting that my mom's selfish for having kids and she got around, so our dad probably isn't even our real dad which is why he left my mom. When I was 10, I finally told my mom about these comments. She refused to keep us in the same room as our aunt and we've really had no relationship with her. When I was 11, my aunt moved from the same neighborhood as my mom and grandparents to a house out in the country about two hours away and I had no real contact with her for the next seven years. When I was 18, my aunt started trying to reestablish a relationship with me, but I kept my contact with her low. I've been working for a few years and I've saved enough to rent my own apartment. This year, my aunt was hit by a car and has had a whole slew of health problems. Because of that, she's been needing to visit the hospital frequently and will need to start physical therapy. Her house is really far from most health facilities and, because she lives alone, she hasn't got anybody to take her back and forth every day. She doesn't have the money to buy a new house in a more convenient location and she doesn't want to sell her current house because it has lots of land for her dogs and she wants to continue living there when she gets better. The rest of my family lives in the city and can access all sorts of health facilities much easier. My brother lives at college. My grandparents have moved in with my mom who's still angry at my aunt and refuses to talk to her. That leaves me. Because I was hesitant and not outright rejecting contact with my aunt, she thinks she still has a chance to live with me. There's two major issues with this. One, my aunt has two dogs that she adores and I don't want to take care of them while she's still recovering. And two, I don't really like my aunt and I don't want her living with me. I'm afraid that a relationship would cause a divide in the family. I'm also worried she'll find out things about me and gossip about it like she did with my mom. Fundamentally, if I had a closer relationship with my aunt in my childhood, I might have considered it. But because of her justifying being cruel by her child freeness, I don't think I'm going to make this accommodation for her. I told her as much and she called me a jerk for abandoning her when she's vulnerable. My mom and brother support me, but my grandparents told me to just go along with it so that we can all stop the fighting. Am I the jerk? Not the jerk. You should just tell her that people recovering from injuries are dirty and scream and annoy everybody until they can take care of themselves again. You reap what you sow, auntie. Or tell her, just like you're child-free, I'm jerk-free. I don't want anyone who treats people horribly, human or adult, in my home. OP, there are so many child-free people who seem to treat kids like garbage. One thing they don't seem to realize is that one day they'll get old and they'll need help from someone younger, unless they're incredibly wealthy, I guess. The thing is, they don't deserve that help. They haven't earned it. Older people get sick, get dirty, and need more help. It's the circle of life and they often rely on the help of all the kids they cared for to assist them in their old age. People have understood this for a long time. Your aunt should have thought about that before she was so awful to all of you. Seriously, just tell her no. Don't open the door to let someone like that in your house. Okay boss, I'll hit my KPIs. This story came from five years ago when I worked for a small IT MSP company. We had four full-time techs, with the newest tech having about 5 years of experience and me being the most seasoned tech with nearly 15 years of experience. Between the four of us, we managed about a thousand PCs and about 20 servers spread out over about 30 clients. None of us were assigned to a specific client, we would all take turns grabbing whatever tickets came in. All of our work was lump sum or contract work, so we never had to worry about how long a problem took to fix or how much it would cost the client. 
We had an account manager who handled all of the billing and things with the clients. It was a dream job for a tech. We got to show up and do our jobs and not have to deal with sales or billing or any client drama. I not only had the most experience, but was also the most self-motivated. I would often come in early and get started on the tickets that came in after hours, and I would assist the other techs if they came across a complex problem. Everyone, including the owner, referred to me as the senior tech, even though that wasn't my title. After two years of working there, I decided to talk to the owner about a raise. I brought all kinds of information to our meeting, showing that I closed the most tickets and received the most positive feedback from a survey we sent to our clients. He agreed to give me a raise, but said he wanted to think about how much to give me and that he would get back to me. A few weeks later, he called a company meeting and announced that he had decided to change some things and that he would no longer be giving anyone raises. Instead, he would set up KPIs, key performance indicators, and the entire tech team would receive weekly bonuses based on hitting those numbers. I didn't like this at all, as it meant my pay was dependent on the performance of everyone on the team and not just me. I found out later one of the other techs had also asked for a raise, so this was the owner's solution to pay us less. The KPIs were simple enough. If a ticket came in, we had to acknowledge it within 15 minutes to achieve a score of 100. If we missed the 15 minute window, the score for that ticket was zero. There were a total of 10 things we had to hit, including how long the ticket was open before we marked it as complete. If the total score for the week was above 90, we each received a $100 bonus. I saw major problems with this bonus system and I shared my concerns with the owner. He got very annoyed with me and said, just hit the KPIs. Cue the malicious compliance. We all figured out pretty quickly how to game the KPI system. We could acknowledge a ticket in the system, but it didn't check if we had actually called the client. We would just email and mark the ticket as reached out to the client. A big issue is that sometimes a client would put in a low priority ticket and ask that we schedule it for sometime the following week, but that would make us miss our KPI. So we would start hounding the client to schedule it sooner and if they weren't available, we would simply close the ticket. We quickly learned to hit our KPIs and start getting a bonus every week. However, it caused our customer service to drop, which is exactly what I had warned the owner of. During the previous two years, we had never had a complaint about our service, but now there were multiple complaints every week. The whole process added a ton of stress to us as we all started to fight when someone missed a KPI, and we all started to work late on Fridays to try to get in those last few numbers. After two months, the owner finally realized he had made a mistake. He removed the bonus system without giving us a raise and asked us to go back to how things were. At this point, I was so stressed, I had already started looking for another job and we had lost two clients. I was the first to put in my two weeks notice, but before I left, the other three techs had all put in their notices as well. The last I heard, the company had lost over half its clients and the owner had to bring in several new techs paying them over 20% more than I had asked for in my raise. Am I the jerk for causing a scene and leaving a free vacation? My brother, Nate, and his wife, Jen, invited me and my daughter, Maddie, who's 10, to go on vacation with them and their kids, Laura, who's 12, and Danny, who's 9. Nate and Jen are extremely well off. They both have high-paying jobs and earn around $350,000 a year between them. Maddie and I are middle class, I own a small house and Maddie goes to a private school. Maddie has a good life, but it doesn't compare to her cousins. My brother and Jen rented a house for us and paid for the rental, all of the food, and all of the activities. The only thing I paid for was gas when driving myself and Maddie to the house. I have to say, Nate and I don't get along very well, but I have a great relationship with Jen, mostly because of how they are with the kids. Nate tells the kids they don't have to be nice to anyone never encourages them to share their toys and doesn't discipline his kids. Jen is the opposite. She constantly tells the kids to share with their cousins and will punish them if they're being rude to the other kids or adults. Now to the vacation. They rented a three-bedroom house. Nate and Jen had the master bedroom. I had the second bedroom with a double bed and all of the kids were going to share a room with two bunk beds, four beds in total. The first night was pretty rough. The kids brought tons of toys but refused to let Maddie play with them. Jen came in and told them that before they left, they told them that they'd have to share their toys, so either they share or she takes them away. They were a little rude but mostly fine the rest of the night. The next night, Jen went out to dinner with an old friend and Nate and I were home with the kids. 
We were getting the kids ready for bed. An argument broke out between them because Laura and Danny decided they don't want to share with Maddie and told her to sleep on the couch. I expected Nate to tell them that the bedroom was for all of the kids, but he told Maddie that she either has to sleep in my room or on the couch. I asked if he was serious and he said yes, that his kids weren't comfortable sharing with Maddie and since he paid for the house, he has a right to kick Maddie out of the room. I told Maddie to get her bag and that if she doesn't have a bed, we're going home. Maybe an hour after we left, Jen came back and asked why Maddie and I left. I told her what happened and she asked me to come back and promised me that she'd take care of her husband and the kids because she wants her kids to have a good relationship with their cousins. I said no and shortly after we got home, I got a call from my brother yelling at me for causing a scene, creating problems between him and his wife and being ungrateful for a free vacation. He got our parents involved and they're agreeing that it's a free vacation and I can't be picky. Am I the jerk for leaving with Maddie? Not the jerk. Nate is one of those parents who wants his kids to win at all costs. He never figured out that the most important thing for a parent to remember is to raise decent human beings. That's what his wife is trying to do. He's bent on raising a couple of jerks. I feel sorry for Jen. Your parents are totally wrong. You did the right thing. Sounds like a miserable free vacation. Am I the jerk for saying no to a promotion? I'm newly married and my husband is upset. I'm a software engineer and my husband works in construction management. I grew up broke, so honestly I feel like I'm loaded right now. I make $120,000 a year and my husband makes $80,000 a year. I've gone from counting literal pennies because my budget was that tight to not having to worry about buying anything that we need. So at work, when my boss offered me a program manager position but said that my salary would be reviewed at the next review cycle. I went and got a drink with the guy who has that job now and the guy who had the job before him. The current guy said he was done out of a raise. He took the promotion when it was implied that one was coming and it never came. And the guy before him? He was making less than I am currently in the role and kept getting his requests for raises rejected. That night I told my husband about my day and how I wasn't sure if I should take the promotion. We talked a bit and he thought I should just for my resume. The next morning, I asked my boss what the salary for the promotion would be, and he said that it would be up to HR in the next review cycle. I had heard that that tends to be the absolute minimum they can get away with, and honestly, that role on the job market was valued at $150,000 to $180,000, so I'd be majorly undervalued. I was starting to think I'd have to be a sucker to take that offer. So I told my boss I was grateful to be considered, but I was not comfortable taking on any role until the terms of employment including compensation, were more fully defined. He said his hands were tied. HR wouldn't renegotiate until the next quarter. I came home and told my husband I declined the promotion, and he was surprisingly mad about it. He said it was something we should have talked about instead of me just going on my own, and that I knew he didn't agree with me. I said that I knew my job. The financials weren't looking great, and you can't get water from a stone, and if I took that, I'd be doubling my workload for nothing. He said I'd have something for my resume that would let me negotiate a higher pay elsewhere since it'd open up other management roles for me. I said I liked being an individual contributor. I wouldn't enjoy management, so that wasn't something I cared about. He said, It's all about you, isn't it? And he was upset because we're married now and I was impacting both of our financial futures since I didn't want a hard job. And that it was normal to take on additional responsibilities and then have a salary review. I just didn't know because I'm too young, 27 and he's 33, and have never been promoted since I job hopped too much. I said it was an old school way of thinking to slave away for free on the hope that you'd be rewarded. I tried that at my first two jobs and that's why I quit. All it does is tell them that you're cheap and gullible. He called me naive and said that I was too idealistic. Am I the jerk for declining the promotion? Holy cow, not the jerk. I'm a software engineer and I would hate being a PM. It's much more work, but it also is a completely different role. I wouldn't call it a promotion, it's a different job. Your husband could switch careers and make more than 80k if you're quite high, combined income isn't enough. The only difference is that you were directly offered this position rather than seeking it out. It's a nice cherry on top that it's a crappy offer. Am I the jerk for telling my mother to buzz off and saying she doesn't get to decide what I do with my life anymore? Three years ago, I learned that my mother had lied to me my whole life. 
I found out my father wasn't my biological father, that my mother had been married, widowed while pregnant with me, and that she severed all contact from my biological father's family, met my father, married him, and they agreed to never tell me the truth. I only found this out because my maternal grandmother had me go through some old stuff at her house and I found photos and documents. I confronted my mother. She told me it didn't matter and to leave it be. I confronted her and my father. They told me what I learned hadn't changed anything and to forget about it. I demanded that they tell me the truth, so I got his story. She never said anything bad about my biological father or his family, only that she felt it was best to move on and to let my father be the only father I knew about. She didn't want him to be my step anything. She didn't want me to ever feel like I was anything less than his. She told me I was never my biological father's baby, that she had loved him, but he was in the past. He was in the ground, and his family had no right to stay in my life. My father told me he wanted me to leave it there and to not seek out my biological family. I told them I didn't want anything to do with them again. We were no contact for two years, my choice. I was able to find my biological father's family. They were so happy I reached out. They showed me how they had looked for my mother and for me. My mother's family admitted she told them and everyone she knew not to tell them anything about her life and to never share where we were. I got to know them and they became my family. It hasn't always been easy. They have so much grief that they never got to know me growing up and I feel it too, as well as how robbed I feel that I never got to know about my biological father. I look just like him and I always wondered why I looked so different from the rest of my family. I also found out my father had set money aside for me over the weeks he knew my mother was pregnant. About a year ago, some contact was reinstated between me and my parents. I haven't forgiven them and it's not easy to speak to them. They did learn recently how involved my father's family is now and how I have my biological relatives around. They don't like this. My mother decided to ask about the future, my wedding, etc and said I can't have both there. I told her if she wants to be there, she'd need to accept that my family will be. She told me I'm choosing someone I never knew over loving parents. She also told me I was her kid. I told her to buzz off and told her she doesn't get to decide what I do with my life anymore. She's still not over what I said and she called me petulant. Am I the jerk? Holy wow, you are not the jerk here, but wow. She denied you access to important family literally robbing you of life-forming relationships. And now she's still trying to force you to choose between your families? What on earth is she afraid of here? I'd seriously be asking what exactly she has against them. She's being extremely unreasonable. I'm so, so sorry. I can't imagine the pain you've gone through and are going through. OP. It's more about what she wanted from our lives. She didn't want the word step to ever cross my mind didn't want a non-nuclear family, knew that my biological relatives would mean I would always know we weren't that. Not the jerk. You don't say how old you are, but you're obviously old enough that you should have been told the truth from the moment it was appropriate and all the way through growing up. Your mother did you and your dad's family a terrible disservice by keeping up this lie. I'm so sorry you missed out on knowing what you should have known. If your mom insists on you choosing, Simply say that your dad's family will be at your important events and if she decides to make you choose, she's the one who gets left off the guest list because she had you all to herself growing up due to her lies. OP, I'm 21 now. You're the jerk. Honestly, you sound ungrateful as heck. You grew up with a mom and dad who loved you and were there for you. I grew up in the system bouncing around from foster parents to group homes, so maybe I'm biased. But then you find out that your biological father passed before you were born and then decide to cut contact with your parents over it? You sound like you have major issues and the only people I feel bad for are your parents. You sound exactly like someone who would have pulled the you're not my real dad card if you'd known he was your stepdad. So at least your parents got to have a good life while you were growing up before you went all psycho on them. Am I the jerk for telling my mom and her husband they had no right to touch my locket? Background on the locket. When I was five, my dad bought me a locket with pictures of him, my mom, my sister, and brother, both older. When I was seven, my dad and sister passed in an accident. My locket became something so treasured, I wore it all the time and didn't care if it was a formal event or not. When I was eight, my mom remarried. Mom's husband is Jeff. Jeff had a one-year-old called Nathan whose mom was not in the picture. 
Mom and Jeff then had two daughters together pretty quickly. My locket was something they all knew about because they had seen me wear it. Mom asked me a couple of times to add Jeff, Nathan, and the girls, and I told her that I didn't want to. So when I was 16, Mom and Jeff bought me a new locket with their pictures in it. I never wore it, but I put it in a jewelry box that I own. There were some comments and tensions that I never wore the new one. My half-sisters were upset about me not changing which one I wore all the time. I explained why the original was special and they told me how the new one was more special because it included them. My mom was annoyed at me for how I handled it and Jeff complained at me for not appreciating what they did for me. I'm 19 now and I live in a small apartment. My brother lives with his girlfriend. A couple of weeks ago, we stayed at my brother's house and when I woke up that morning, my locket had been moved. I don't wear it to bed in case it breaks. Went on about my day in that weekend. When I got home a couple of days later, I wanted to look at the photos inside and noticed they had taken out my dad's photo and tried to squeeze in Jeff, Nathan, and the girls. I was angry. I called mom and asked her if she had seen my locket and she told me I drove them to do what they did because I was selfish and inconsiderate and broke their hearts for the last three years by showing which locket I favored and which family I favored as well. She hung up on me. I tried to calm down and went over to their house, mom and Jeff's, and I told them they had no right to touch my locket. Jeff told me they had every right to show a more accurate representation of my family and that I was hurting Nathan and the girls by wearing something that didn't include them when I had something that did. I lost it. I told them they did not have that right and they do not get to tell me who I carry around in my locket or not. I told him he would never be deserving of a spot, told mom she had lost her spot, and then I left, saying they needed to stay away from me. My brother couldn't believe they did it, sided with me, told mom to accept we didn't feel the way she wanted us to feel. Mom and Jeff said I was a jerk. Mom said since dad bought it while they were married, she also bought it and had every right to interfere with it. Am I the jerk here? ETA, just wanted to add that my original locket is set up where you can add little sections to it and add more photos. I just never chose to do that because I wanted it for the people I always considered my core family or the people I was closest to. Part of me wants to remove mom now since this happened. Not the jerk. Cut them off. No one gets to decide who's in that locket. It was a gift. Am I the jerk for not upgrading a family and embarrassing my assistant manager? I, 30 male, lost my job during lockdown as an assistant manager. I had to dip into my savings to survive. When I was on my last leg, a childhood friend, James, 29 male, reached out and he offered me a place to stay. He's now the richest person I know personally. As it turned out, he also had a good job opportunity for me. The terms were very generous. When I was 18, I helped him out a little and he said this was his opportunity to repay me. I met him while working in his father's hotel. Unfortunately, they lost it. So James bought a small luxury hotel and he hired me as a general manager. I also get a small cut of the profits. I was grateful for the job and felt guilty about the additional benefit, but he insisted on it. He's not interested in running the place and he wanted someone he could trust. So I pretty much have the final say in any matter. We hired an assistant manager to help me run the place. Bella, she's in her 30s, is more experienced than me but she had to settle for the assistant manager position. This is the reason for providing the background. If we go by seniority, she should be the GM and I should be the AM. Apart from the occasional haughty attitude, I don't have much trouble from her. A couple of days ago, a family checked in. Two adults and two kids. They were loud and rude. When a bellhop stumbled, they laughed at him and scalded him for dropping their luggage, so not a good first impression. Meanwhile, two couples who were clearly on vacation together and waiting to check in helped the staff out before we could. The family was rude to them also. Yesterday, I got a call from my assistant manager asking if she could upgrade someone to our gold suite. We have five suites. I always keep our best one in reserve for James or his friends, and if there is a vacancy in any of the other four, we sometimes freely upgrade when someone asks. Only I can do it. When I got to the reception, it was the husband asking for an upgrade. When my assistant manager is speaking to me, I could see the rest of the staff were uncomfortable. Fortunately, I saw the two couples from before coming back for the day, so I told the husband I already had upgraded someone else and politely excused myself and talked to the other couples in private and offered them the upgrade. Two reasons for that. First, the couples are staying for two more nights while the family is staying for five more, 
Second, their attitude. Later, when my assistant manager came to know of it, she confronted me. She said she had already promised them the upgrade and I embarrassed her. She demanded me to upgrade the family to our best suite as compensation. I said no and politely pointed out only I have the power to upgrade when it came to the suites. She started blabbering about experience and how I'm ruining the hotel's reputation and called me a jerk. She tried to complain to James, but after a quick phone call with me, he brushed her off. So, am I the jerk? Edit 1. If there are rooms available, any of my staff can ask for my approval to upgrade a guest. I rarely deny them. They generally have good reasons for asking. I encourage this because it makes my staff feel appreciated and they're the ones who know more about the guests than me as they interact with them more than I do. I need to deal with a lot of things like suppliers, etc. As for the AM gunning for my position, she's barking up the wrong tree. I own part, 10%, of the hotel. I didn't ask for it, but James did it anyway. So doing me over is impossible unless I massively mess up. I realized I didn't give the reason my assistant manager gave me, word count limit. Apparently, the guests complain about the services and also about noise during the night. That was why she wanted to upgrade them to prove that we're the best. That explanation didn't sit well with me, so I asked my staff why they were uncomfortable. Every receptionist, floor manager, etc. gets some leeway when dealing with guests. Within limit, they can give discounts or free meals. They don't need approval for little things. As you can guess, higher the position, higher the limit. From what I gathered, this family is always complaining and kept asking to speak to the manager. My assistant manager kept giving them free meals, etc., but instead of using her code, she is ordering the staff member who brought the problem to her to use their code. As for why I didn't know about this, my assistant manager should be the one informing me about these problems, so I will probably let her go and promote one of the good ones. I still don't know what's going on with this particular family and my assistant manager. Not the jerk. You are the boss, not her. She said she already promised them the upgrade, plus she demanded you upgrade the family? This is where you need to have a sit down with your employee. Document this discussion and put it in her personal file to show that you don't want this happening again. You make that decision, not her. Start acting like the general manager you are. The background information is irrelevant. You're the general manager, she's the assistant manager. Also, be ready to replace her. Start interviewing for additional check-in person. As a former department manager, never stop feeding the beast. Not the jerk. But at the same time, if this story had been written from her perspective, everyone here would be praising her and telling her what a jerk you are. They'd be calling you a nepotism hire and rooting for her to take your job from you. She'd make you sound like a total tool who doesn't do any work and just wants to control everyone. Am I the jerk for buying my boyfriend's daughter a phone? I, 32, female, have been dating my boyfriend for a few months now. Jacob, male, 35, is a widower and has a 12-year-old daughter, Katie. I've only met Katie recently, but she's a lovely girl. Well-behaved, polite, does well in school, absolute joy to be around. She had a birthday yesterday and Jacob organized a party for her. Her grandparents were there as well as a few of her friends. A week before the party, a package with Katie's gift arrived. Jacob confessed to me what it was. Katie had been begging for a phone for ages and Jacob bought her a cheap 20 pound phone. You know, the really basic ones. And he ordered the box for an iPhone. I think you all know where this is going. I asked him if he was going to buy her an iPhone and he said that it was a prank and he's got some books for her. She loves reading, but she will get that cheap phone and that's it and the prank will be funny. I hated the idea. I hate these pranks. It wasn't my place. I barely know Katie, but I could see that she'd be hurt and I knew that she'd be devastated. So I bought her an older iPhone model, refurbished as a gift. When her birthday came, she was devastated. You could tell. She politely accepted the old phone and didn't make a scene, but was crying in the bathroom after. Jacob thought it was so funny and her friends mocked her. I calmed her down and asked her to come downstairs as there was one more present waiting for her. When she got her phone, she was so happy, even though it wasn't the newest or brand new, she was elated and the humiliation long forgotten. But Jacob was fuming, told me I was a jerk for undermining his authority and I had no right to spoil Katie, she spoiled enough. I thought I was doing the right thing, but I can understand where he's coming from. I barely entered her life and it may seem like I'm trying to bug her affection, which I'm not. He's so angry with me. I don't know if I was the jerk, 
I might have made Katie happy, but I hurt him. I'm conflicted. Was I the jerk here? Edit. I did mention it to him and told him how awful it would be, but he told me it would be funny and to relax and that I was no fun. Basically, he wouldn't listen. Not the jerk, but your taste in men is questionable. Cruelly pranking her in front of her friends on her birthday indicates that he's always going to be a jerk. Am I the jerk for telling my brother-in-law that he wouldn't be moving with us to the new house? My wife and I decided to look for a bigger home last month and sell the one that we live in. She told me she's finally ready to have more kids and wants at least two more. We currently live in a three-bedroom house with two bathrooms. We have a room, my daughter has one, and my brother-in-law stays in one. Me and him have had our differences in the past, but we're good now. Last week, we went to view a home that looked promising. My brother-in-law asked if he could tag along to see, and I said sure. The house was beautiful, and while we're there, he commented that he would like one of the rooms on the opposite side of the house. I didn't say anything at that moment, but when we got back in the car, he commented again that he wanted that certain room. I straight up told him when the time came to switch houses, he most likely isn't going with us. He looked surprised, and before he could say anything, my wife looked at me and asked why he wouldn't be coming with us. I told her she wanted more kids, and the only reason we're moving is to have more space for another kid. She said the kids could share rooms. I told her it wouldn't be fair to our daughter to sleep in a room with a baby that is definitely going to cry. She turned around and told her brother that she would work something out and that he's coming with us. I got upset and told her brother that he wouldn't because while I did agree to let him live with us, it was not permanent. It's not the life I pictured living that he would understand once he gets married and has kids. My wife is upset and is firm on her brother coming with us and told me I'm selfish and inconsiderate of people. I did start to feel like a jerk after I thought about it. Am I the jerk? Stop the house hunting. No more visits to houses. Don't even look at ones that she finds. You have a much larger problem to solve. You're done with the live-in brother-in-law. Time for the bird to fly. Does your wife expect him to live with you forever? Not the jerk if this is a deal breaker for you. Stand your ground and work this out. My significant other and I have a rule for something like this. It takes two yeses for a yes and one no for a no. We're identical twins, so you have to financially support my kid. Okay, so this isn't my story. This is my best friend Tommy. All names have been changed. Tommy and I became best friends in middle school. We bonded over the fact that we're both identical twins who have a horrible twin sibling. Tommy's brother Jack is a deadbeat who thinks everything should be handed to him. He also is a huge player and has a new girlfriend every few months. This eventually came back to get him when he got one of them pregnant. Now, Jack has no job and he lives with his parents who completely support him. But when they found out that he had got his girlfriend pregnant, they made it clear that he had to get a job if he wanted to stay there. His girlfriend, Abby, also has no job and has the same attitude as Jack. Neither of them wants to work and they both believe everyone else should be supporting them. Tommy has a good job and he makes good money, which absolutely upsets Jack. When they found out Abby was pregnant, they asked Tommy for a substantial amount of money. Tommy refused, which caused Jack to get mad again. This caused them to come up with an insane plan to get money out of Tommy. One day, they confronted Tommy and told him that if he didn't give them the money, they'd just say that he was the father and go after him for child support. They read a story online where a woman actually did end up getting child support from two identical twins because they couldn't figure out who was the father. From what Tommy told me, they had pretty smug looks on their faces when they told him. Here's a sum of how the conversation went. Now, I'm assuming this from what Tommy told me, so it definitely won't be word for word, but it pretty much went like this. They were at a party for one of Tommy and Jack's relatives when Jack and Abby came up to Tommy and said, Jack, Sir, have you changed your mind about giving us the money? Tommy, No. Jack, We figured you'd say that, so we have another plan. Tommy, What plan? Jack, Well, since you won't give us the money, we thought of another idea. What are you talking about? Jack, Abby read online about how a woman was able to get child support from two identical twin brothers because DNA-wise, they can't tell who the father was. So, we're going to tell people you're the father? And since your DNA is the same as mine, any test will come out positive. Tommy was a little shocked when they first said this. Not because he was worried, but because he'd realized his brother was even dumber than he thought he was. Tommy, 
I know you smoke a lot, and who knows what else you do, but you seriously can't be this dumb. Jack, I'm not dumb, I'm a genius. It worked before, look it up. Tommy, yeah, but you're forgetting a very important factor in all of this. What's that? The whole having cancer as a teenager thing, the countless rounds of chemo, the multiple surgeries. Nice try, but people can still have kids, look it up. This caused Tommy to start laughing. Jack, why are you laughing? Tommy, because you idiot. I had testicular cancer and had to have both of them removed. I have literally been sterile for over 13 years. Well, they don't know about that. Tommy, my medical history does. All I have to do is show them and the case will easily be thrown out. This made Jack and Abby mad and they started belittling Tommy, calling him every name in the book. For those worried about the baby, they eventually ended up putting the baby up for adoption. So yeah, as a few pointed out, the girlfriend's name changes in the middle. That's because I messed up and put the real name, so I had to fix it. My bad. My wife rejected my son's very thoughtful birthday gift, so I canceled her party. I, male 36, remarried after my late wife passed. I have a son who's 15. My current wife and I have been together for two years. She generally has a good relationship with my son, although they tend to have some disagreements from time to time. My son has background in arts that involves wood. He used to help his grandfather with his woodworking and learned how to make handmade wooden items and uses them as gifts. I planned a dinner party for my wife's birthday at a prestigious restaurant. The day before the party, she was cleaning my son's room and saw what he got her for her birthday and that was a wooden tree with mine, hers, and his name on it. She talked with him and told him while she thought it was a sweet gift, she asked that he not bring it to the restaurant and give it to her there. Why? No idea. When my son told me this, I just had to call her out on it. She flat out said that she thought the gift looked ridiculous and she didn't want it to be seen in that prestigious restaurant or in front of her guests. I lost it on her and I told her that she should be ashamed of herself for saying this when my son was being sincere and thoughtful. She swore she wasn't ashamed nor embarrassed by his work and even said she'll take the gift but she simply didn't want it to be seen there. I told her not to worry about it since I decided to cancel the whole thing. She went off on me, calling me unreasonable for outright canceling her birthday over such a trivial thing. I refused to keep arguing, but she threw a fit about how I ruined her birthday and made her lose respect for me and my promises. My son kept the gift since she left the house two days ago, and her mom has been chewing me out for my decision and calling me a jerk for treating her daughter like this. It could be that it was not a big deal and I overreacted, but my son was feeling hurt by her request. Holy cow! Not the jerk at all. Your wife doesn't sound like a very kind person at all, but incredibly shallow and cruel. This calls for a, what the heck is wrong with her? If I had a stepkid for two years and this was the gift I got, I would be bawling. It would be the best present I ever got. You want me to be a part of your family tree after you lost your mom? The only way that gifting me that present would ruin my birthday dinner is because I'd cry the makeup off of my face into the filet mignon. Not the jerk. Thank you for having your sons back in all of this. That means more than you know. Cancel the whole marriage. Am I the jerk for wanting my wife to make my dinner? Me, male 25, and my wife of over a year, female 26, we've been together for over four years. We've always had a good relationship with each other. It has felt very love-filled. We recently got into an apartment, one bedroom, about 700 square feet, so it's not huge. Once this happened, I feel like things may have shifted. I work very long hours throughout the week, with sometimes only one or maybe zero days off in the week, average of 75 to 80 hours a week. I bring home a majority of the money. My paychecks cover almost 80% of our whole income, not that it affects how I think of her in our relationship. She's able to provide things like fun groceries, snacks and sweets, and when we go out she can pay for things like the tip or drinks, and I really appreciate that and I tell her thank you when she can swing it. She also does most of the chores in the small apartment. Other than that, I'm the person paying for our life. Groceries, toiletries, outings, clothes, makeup, and not to mention rent and all other real bills. She works in a very different field and works three, sometimes if her job requires, four days a week. She's working towards her career and I'm proud of her on this. Most days, she'll work an average of six, maybe seven hours on her work days. 
this is where the problem has started. A lot of my work nights are late, 12 or 1 a.m. when I get home. I'll pack snacks, but I never get to eat. So a lot of days, I come home hungry for an actual meal. Recently, those nights have been more frequent and I just don't want to have to cook something for myself after a 13-hour day after doing the same all week. I just want to be able to eat with the minimal amount of work when I get home. The other night, I came home around 1.30 a.m. and found my wife passed out on the couch with an empty personal pizza from Little Caesars. I got excited, thinking that I had a cold one in the fridge waiting for me. Wrong. Annoyed, but not upset, I microwave some Chef Boyardee, scarf it down, and call it a night. The next day I have the same kind of night, around 1.30 I get home. There she is, passed out, now with a bowl of macaroni and weenies, one of my favorites. And again, nothing in the fridge for me. Not understanding why she couldn't just make enough for the both of us and put my bowl in the fridge, I woke her up to ask. She gets a little snappy if someone wakes her up, but this time she was really angry, saying that she is not my maid and I'm being lazy trying to make her cook for me. I tell her I'm just hungry after a long day and it upsets me to see that she cooked for herself and didn't think about me at all. I said she was being inconsiderate and that really set her off, saying if I want a slave, then she's not it. I told her I don't want a slave. I want someone who seems to care about me. She looked at me with a shocked face and stormed out. Her mother texted saying that she showed up at their house bawling and how I should be more considerate of her feelings. I haven't even responded because I just feel hurt and not cared for. I just wanted dinner. Am I the jerk? Edit. I really should have mentioned this is a conversation we have had before and I feel ignored since she barely acknowledges when I've brought it up. These last two times are after multiple conversations. Also, definitely didn't want to seem like she shouldn't be sleeping at 1. Passed out is just terminology I use. If I'm dead asleep at 4 a.m., I'm passed out. I appreciate the other things she does for me, like cleaning, but the other 8 hours of free time in her day, I wanted to be thought of since I would do the same for her, no questions asked. You're the jerk. Saying she doesn't care about you when she does all kinds of other things for you, chores, dates, etc. is very belittling. I'd be upset with you too. I feel like you could have asked way nicer. I also think you should maybe consider meal planning for yourself if 1am is not a good time for you to cook. You're the jerk. You can absolutely ask her to cook for you, but interrupting a necessary physical activity like sleep just to ask her why she didn't cook and then accuse her of being inconsiderate and not loving you? You pick the completely wrong way to handle this conversation. OP, learn to take a no. Your wife isn't required to take on making your dinner in addition to everything else she's already doing. You say you appreciate all the things your wife already does, but she is clearly not feeling appreciated if she feels like your slave. My vote stands. You're the jerk. Just because you work past midnight doesn't mean you get to throw a fit when you come home and don't see food. You shouldn't wake someone up in the middle of the night just to ask why was your meal not prepared, especially when there was no prior discussion on this. There's nothing wrong with wanting your partner to prepare some dinner you can eat after you return from work at 1.30 a.m. Just discuss it with her like adults beforehand. Waking her up in the middle of the night and throwing a tantrum is not the way to go. Not the jerk. I hope lots of younger guys see this story and realize that marriage is a complete joke these days. It used to mean finding a partner to have a family with, who you protect and support financially, and in return you actually got something out of it, like a loving wife who enjoyed spending 30 minutes a night making a meal for the family as a display of her love. These days, getting married just means you now have no choice other than to shut up and bow down to her every spoiled and entitled whim or risk getting divorced and lose half your stuff that you worked hard for while she just benefited from. Happened to me, my brother, and most of our friends. Marriage in 2023, not even once. You're the jerk. She's right, she's not your maid. You seriously mean to tell me you're working 80 hours a week and can't even afford to stop and pick up some McDonald's on the way home like a big boy? I swear, if my husband tried to toddler tantrum crap like this with me, he'd be single in a heartbeat and he knows it. A real man would get home and cook his own food, then cook extra for her in case she's hungry. Don't be surprised when she leaves you for a real man who's not afraid to cook his own meal every now and then. I can't help but wonder if the roles were reversed, if people would still be- Whoa, 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 you can't say that, Karen. That, that really ticks off the Reddit people. Leave the floor wet? Alright, enjoy your rotten wood.
Back in the early 2000s, my mother, 40 female, worked as a cleaner for a couple places and took me, 13 male, with her to help. One place we worked for was the only real estate place in town. We cleaned up before the people who worked there got in. When I started there, it was small and somewhat dirty. Old smelly cubicle partitions and faded brown off-color walls, ingrained dirt in the linoleum. We cleaned and I literally couldn't tell the difference after we were done, except the mirror in the washroom not having any spots on it and the floor being wet from the fresh mopping. Then the town started becoming a cottage town and it decided that they will move to a nicer place. Cottagers might find the griminess a little off-putting. New place had a bit more space, brand new blue cubicle partitions, newly painted walls that still smelled the first day I cleaned in there, and a cheap hardwood panel floor. That floor was a bit of a problem. See, before, when we mopped, we would just leave the water to dry on the linoleum. We could do that because we got there at about 6.30 and they opened at 7.30. The place was small enough that it was mopped by around 7 before we left and would mostly be dry by the time people started arriving. If we did the same thing for this cheap wood floor, my mother was worried we would have water seep into the cracks between the wood panels and rot them. So a new method for mopping was devised. First, I dunk the mop, then ring the mop lightly. Mop up, ring the mop again, but fully this time, and then mop up as much of the excess water as possible. This new method actually visibly got a lot more water off the floor. By the time we left, some of the earlier mopped areas would look mostly dry. Good solution, mom. Couple weeks into the new place, my mother gets contacted by the manager and a new order comes in that we are not to dry the floor. I asked if she explained why we dried it. She had. I found this order a bit baffling at the time and it only occurred to me today the reason why he ordered this. The manager got in earlier than everyone else at about 7.15, so I actually saw him a few rare times when we ran late. The old floor would have still been visibly wet in the old place when he got in. The new floor was now dry when he got in. He thought we were skipping mopping in order to leave early. Even though I didn't understand at the time that he thought we weren't doing our job, I, of course, found this new order stupid. I thought, he wants the floors wet when he gets in? Fine. Cue malicious compliance. You see, I did the mopping while my mom cleaned the washroom because I was a young strapping lad and she was my mom so I did what she said. I now had a standing order from the boss to leave a wet floor and I was going to do so. From that day forth, not only did I not dry the floor, I now didn't even wring the mop after dunking it. I dipped it in the water and just let water slop off the mop as I pulled it directly out of the bucket. There was no way this was going to dry before he got in. Probably not for an hour after he got in either. Two weeks after I started doing this, lo and behold, the wood paneling is already starting to separate at the seams. Dirt is accumulating between tiles. It proves impossible to remove. I was a bit shocked at the time at how fast that had happened. Four weeks into the new mopping routine, the floor was rotting. Was my mother psychic or what? It was apparently very cheap fiberboard with a paper-thin plastic wood grain pattern on it. I would have guessed a laminate wood grain on top of semi-waterproof fiberboard if you had asked me four weeks ago. The floor now has visible divots and lines where the plastic paper sank into the deteriorating wood underneath. These trap dirt in them as well. How classy. The floor, not even two months after they had moved into the new place, was even worse than the old beat up linoleum one. At this point, I asked my mother if we should start drying the floor, and wouldn't you know it, she had already asked. The answer was no, leave it wet. Baffling. We cleaned there for another month or so. I barely felt safe walking on the floor, as it was now a tripping hazard with warped parts popping up. It was also disintegrating. Splinters of wood would pop off every time I swept. The floor now had the dubious distinction of being the worst floor I had seen in a place that wasn't dilapidated. Am I the jerk for giving my mom the wrong start time for my birthday lunch so she'd be on time? I'm 22, female. My mom, who's in her mid-40s, is one of those people who's always late to everything. I'm talking family get-togethers, birthdays, graduations, weddings, you name it, she's showing up late. At first, growing up, I just thought it was because she's bad with time, but as I've gotten older, I genuinely believe she likes making an entrance. I personally find it, one, rude, and two, embarrassing, because it's not like it happens once in a while. It literally happens at every single function she's invited to that has a set time. Many family members have complained about this. Nothing ever changes. 
It's gotten to the point that whenever my grandma has family lunches or dinners, she'll tell my mom it starts an hour earlier than it actually does, so she'll be there on time. My mom doesn't know that my grandma does this. It's a joke between grandma and I. This past weekend was my 22nd birthday. My grandma wanted to do lunch for me at her place with our immediate family. The lunch was to start at 2 p.m., but we told my mom 1 p.m. I had plans later that evening to go out for dinner with my boyfriend, so I wanted to leave my grandma's house at around 5, the absolute latest, because I needed to go home and get ready. Well, of course, my mom was late. We called her at like 2.30 p.m. to see where she was because, you know, it's her daughter's birthday. She had just left her house at 2.30 and still had to pick up her boyfriend on her way to my grandma's, 30 to 35 minutes away, so none of us were expecting her to arrive until like 3.30 p.m. She finally arrives two and a half hours late from the time we told her. We questioned my aunt and she said she felt bad lying to my mom. Everyone is pretty annoyed, but we all move on. Fast forward an hour later, 4.30 p.m. I have to start leaving. My mom starts getting all annoyed with me that I'm leaving so soon and that she barely got to see me for my birthday. I told her that my life doesn't revolve around her and that she should have been there sooner. She started giving me attitude and listing all these excuses as to why she's late. I couldn't be bothered to hear them, so I left. Later that night, she messaged me saying I was acting like a jerk towards her and it was rude of me to lie to her about the time the lunch started. My mom and my aunt think I'm the jerk for lying to her. My grandma doesn't think it's a big deal and they're overreacting. I came here for some outside opinions. Not the jerk, but stop lying to her. Stop accommodating her. Don't hold up any events or dinners or lunches or anything for her. If she arrives to a meal or function and it's over and the food is either gone or put away, then it's, oh well, should have been here on time. I would never hold up one more thing for her. She's rude and has no respect for other people's time. Am I the jerk for ignoring my aunt and uncle when they came to my house as guests? I, 28 female, live alone, away from all of my family members, working a job that's been my dream job since I was little. I have a pretty static lifestyle that includes my work, sports cars, my house, and nightlife. My aunt, my mom's sister, who's 50 female, and her husband, essentially my uncle, 54 male, sent their only son off to college somewhere near the city where I live in. They wanted to go see their son and asked me if they could stay over a couple of days and see me as well on their way. My mom also insisted I say yes, so I did. They stayed with me for a week on their way to their son's city and nine days on the way back. While they were with me, I got up around 5.30 in the morning, did my workout routine and left home at 7. I came back around 11 like I always do. My aunt said I could have managed everything much better and that there was nothing in the fridge when they came to my house. I told them they could order anything they wanted on my account and there was only fruit and water because that's all I need when I'm home. She also complained that I spent some nights away, which could be avoided, but I'm just used to my routine. My aunt also said I could at least spend one meal with them, which I did on the weekend, but other than that, I've got work. After I explained everything, my aunt said I was being a rude host and that she wanted to see her niece in a much better condition. She even got teary-eyed for goodness sake. I said I can, of course, strive to be better, but this is how my life is, and she came here knowing this. She hasn't spoken to me at all since she went back other than a text saying thank you. My mom says I need to get my life together and apologize to my aunt. Was I the jerk? Edit. They were initially supposed to stay for two days each time, and they asked to extend the visit every night. There's a lot to see in the area I live in, and I have plenty of extra space, so I honestly didn't mind them staying as long as it didn't disturb my routine. Not the jerk. They didn't just come for the weekend. They were there for over two weeks total. It's unreasonable to ask you to put your life on hold for the duration of their visits. Furthermore, they, and your mother, sort of invited themselves. They should be happy for a free place to stay and eating on your dime for a couple of weeks and leave it at that. Slight you're the jerk. You agree to host, then you should host. Either that or let them know it's just a place to crash on their way to and from sun. But as it stands, you knew they wanted to visit you and you agreed with this. So making a little bit of time for them to share some meals, spend an evening, at the very least have some food in your house, would have been nice. Stop complaining about your neighbors. Okay, sure. I had moved in an apartment with a roommate last summer. When we first came in, the biggest part of the sale was the fact that the apartment was freshly renovated and soundproof. This one is important and you'll see why. 
So when we got in, my roommate immediately fell in love with it, and I was too. When we moved in, we were very careful not to bother anyone, as we wanted to quickly have a good relationship with our neighbors. Oh, did you see the new neighbors? They only move during the day. They don't make sound during the night. What nice people, kind of deal. And we can safely say it worked. What we did not know, however, is that we were only three renters when we first came in. Us on the floor, another family upstairs on the opposite side, and another one on the third floor, with the empty apartment between us. Turns out, the soundproof statement was accurate, but only in regards to the inside-to-outside situation. When our upstairs neighbors moved, it was a nightmare. Sound from 5 a.m. to past midnight, five days in a row, dropping stuff, speaking loudly, yelling, or walking in their apartment with shoes on. Out of frustration on the fifth day, I walk upstairs and meet my neighbor at midnight. I ask them to cease their activities for the night. I have work in the morning and I cannot be kept up all night. I understand they were freshly moved in and they might have had a tight schedule, but midnight was too late to be moving stuff. He didn't reply and closed the door on me. I go downstairs and the sound starts over again. I notify my landlord and he tells me he'll handle it and apologizes for the situation, explaining to me my neighbor was just moving and that he probably didn't understand what I was saying because of a language barrier. The neighbors were extremely loud. I know a lot of Karens will use that as an excuse to talk about their neighbors, but when I say loud, I mean it. There was no stop to their loud noises. It seemed like they couldn't be bothered to hold something without dropping it, or jumping up and down on the floor, or purposely banging things against the wall. I recorded the event and even installed microphones in my home jack to my computer, activating and recording every time there is strong vibration to the house. Over 98 events on Monday, February 14th. I was livid. I send that to the landlord and explain this cannot continue. First, the apartment was poorly soundproofed, which meant we were hearing every sound at all times. Second, we had notified the neighbors about this situation and they have ignored it. I have notified the landlord to awaken them to our situation. I report the issues several times and even advise my landlord that they were very heavy thuds coming from upstairs, which worried me. He answered with, Stop complaining about your neighbors already. I have other things to do. I have answered. Understood, sir. Please be advised this will be my last communication and action to help you in that regard. You know when I said I heard loud bangs? Turns out our upstairs neighbor was doing bench press lifting in his living room, and the heavy thuds I kept hearing was him dropping his weights on the ground. I had warned my roommate about removing anything she didn't want broken from the living room, and lo and behold, four days later, the first crack appeared. Then another. The floor was giving up. I moved the couch out of the way and moved the TV and consoles into the bedroom. Fast forward to three days ago. After another series of loud bangs, I hear a loud crack, followed by an, oh no, followed by very loud noises. I went to the living room to see my neighbor on the ground with several injuries due to the fact that he just went through the floor and brought his bench and weight rack with him. I called an ambulance and the police. The police asked me if I reported the issue with my landlord, which I could confirm due to my communications being made via email. I sent everything and I am now, of course, filing to break my lease due to uninhabitable dwelling. The landlord came in yesterday and just proceeded to explode. Told me I should have made him aware that my neighbor was doing dangerous things, to which I answered I had notified him about the very loud sounds and he never investigated and that he also ordered me to stop complaining about my neighbors. It was not my responsibility to go out of my way to protect his assets if he is unwilling to cooperate with me. My neighbors, roommate, and I are now residing in a hotel until we can find a new place to live. We are now also looking towards adding a bit more salt to the injury by maybe filing for criminal negligence against both our landlord and the neighbor. The first because the apartment was apparently having some flaws and the latter for endangering us. Had I not caught up on what caused the sound earlier, me or, God forbid, my roommate could have been under that. Anyway, it was a fun week and I do enjoy the accommodations of the hotel. Never went to a four-star spa-included hotel before. Turns out the chocolate on the pillow is a lie and I am very disappointed about that. Edit. As I have advised to a few commentators, I followed up with my roommate and she did not take pictures of the event. She got a bit mad, I asked, considering what just happened, and questioned my priorities. 
I then explained that our Reddit story got a lot of attention and some people in the comments requested some visual proof. I will spare you her answer. I will just add that it's okay not to believe this story based on my word alone. If people actually didn't question it, I would be worried. When I posted this story, my only intent was to share my experience and I thought, huh, malicious compliance, neat. If there was a horrible landlord, bad neighbor, Reddit, I would have found prior to submitting this story, probably would have went there instead. I will also add that I'm not an expert or an engineer. How and why something like weights and the like would cause part of the floor to collapse, I cannot say. Was there a structural damage prior? Was there water damage that was never addressed, just covered up? Was the structure just not as sound as I believed it was when I got in? I can't say. I understand some of you might have worked in construction and never have experienced such an event or have actual reasons to suspect a lie due to personal and professional experience. Once again, you can and should question anything on the internet. I just hope you also apply that kind of skepticism, and I mean wanting proof or the opinion of an actual expert prior to making a decision, to more than just Reddit posts. For those who made us laugh and those who have spoken to us, who have been encouraging and constructive, people who actually gave us advice, I thank you very much. It was very nice of everyone, and I wish you the best. Am I the jerk for laughing at the absurdity of my wife taking pictures of herself cleaning? I, 36, male, work full-time, and my wife, who's 27, stays at home. We've been married for five years. I have a good job, so I'm happy to support her. We do not have kids. My wife is something of a slob. I know this isn't the nicest thing to say about your partner, but she would happily step over a pile of clothes in our living room for a month before actually folding them. During the daytime, she doesn't really cook, clean, or do any housework at all. She loves browsing the internet and watching Netflix, but beyond her interests, she can rarely gather up the energy to do much at all. To be honest, before marriage, when I lived alone, my house was much cleaner than it is now. The bizarre thing about this situation is that she's incredibly sensitive about the fact that she doesn't really do much all day and denies it whenever it's brought up. I do my own laundry, prepare my own lunches, and oftentimes cook dinner. She might do the dishes in the evening, or she'll leave them for the next day. A few days ago, I got really tired of it because a pile of her stuff that I didn't know where to put away had been sitting in our living room for over a week. I told her that she really needs to get it together and learn how to clean, even a little, every day. She fired back that she's not a maid, to which I responded, it was clear, because if she went to someone's house, laid on their sofa, and watched Netflix for six hours, she would have been fired on her first day. The next day after I get home from work, my wife and I were still kind of going at it. She suddenly approached me and showed me pictures she took of herself cleaning during the day, repeating, See, this is what I do during the day. I couldn't help myself and began laughing at how ridiculous it was, then said having a fake photo shoot like an Instagrammer didn't mean she was doing a good job around the house. She says I crossed the line. Now she's sulking in her room. I feel like she's trying to emotionally manipulate me, but I could have pushed it too far. Not the jerk. But this sounds like me before I was on ADHD meds and antidepressants. That's exactly what I was thinking. When your brain doesn't brain the same way as other people, you can actually come across as lazy and messy when you're really just struggling. Yeah, the problem here is how does OP approach this topic with his wife without her taking it as him saying, there must be something medically wrong with you to act this way, which I don't think would go over particularly well. If it's pure laziness, obviously that's on her. And while a cleaning photo shoot is maybe silly, I think this is missing the big picture. Everything else sounds potentially like serious mental health issues such as depression or ADHD, a sleep disorder, or other physical illness that can cause chronic fatigue. It may not actually be good for her mental health to be home all the time. I hated going back into work, but it was amazing for me to get out of the house. I really think she needs to speak with a professional about the possibility of depression. She may need help, not mockery. ETA some condensed great points people are making in the replies. Women in their 20s can develop autoimmune disease, usually accompanied by fatigue that ramps up over the years. Even if she did not already have depression, ADHD, or similar, being isolated at home without structure or purpose is a recipe for disaster. It will lead to depression-like symptoms, even if it doesn't become a full true diagnosis. All that said, I don't personally think there's a jerk here. I think she needs a doctor's visit and to get a job even part-time to get out of the house and get structure and purpose in her days. As with most posts here, honest adult communication will go a long way. Karen's sister-in-law loses it on me for canceling my Netflix without telling her. 
Me, 41 female, and my husband, 42 male, subscribed to Netflix seven years ago when our daughter, who's 18, asked us to. We were in a difficult financial situation at the time, but said we'd give it some thought. We caved. However, only on the condition that she spends one night a week watching it with us. Two years after, my brother, who's 34, married his wife, who's 36. She was married previously and has twin daughters, who are 10. I love them to pieces. Sister-in-law then gave birth to their son and all heck broke loose. My nieces were constantly dropped off at either our house or their maternal grandparents' house. There wasn't a word of warning. They were just dropped off and picked up the next day to be deposited somewhere else. I told my brother that we had to talk after a month of this. He texted me back a week later and asked for my Netflix login. He said they needed for bonding time. I should have called BS, but he's my brother and I didn't want to refuse him. Recently, my nieces and I were at the park with our youngest daughter, who's 11. One of my nieces asked to sit with me. She asked why they don't visit often anymore. I say that she should be happy spending time with her parents. She admits that they are left to watch Netflix while sister-in-law and brother spend time with the baby. When I got home, I told my husband. He was beyond furious, shaming my brother for being a bad father. His words, biological or not. I couldn't disagree. It was me who had the idea to unsubscribe altogether and this went beyond teaching them a lesson. We never really used it anymore. My eldest complains that they're apparently going to ban account sharing. This would be a bad thing because she's across the country in college and is the only person who somewhat actively uses it alongside sister-in-law. My husband admitted that the money for the subscription could, and probably should, go towards more useful things. We let our subscription expire and my sister-in-law soon came knocking. She went off on us for canceling, that it wasn't our call to make since they use the account too, yada yada yada. Here's where I think I might be the jerk. I shut the door in her face and said that she needs to seriously self-reflect. She scoffed and left. Ever since, I haven't seen them. Sister-in-law has gone radio silent and my brother speaks to me through our parents. This not only upsets me, but my kids too, particularly my son who's 15. My brother promised to take him to a sport event this week, but has since canceled. Deep down, I know that I did the right thing. However, I frankly feel like crap seeing how miserable my kids are. Not only that, but my niece's relationship with him and sister-in-law is totally unsalvageable, according to my brother, in a Facebook post blaming me and my husband for his now difficult family life, which has led to a few nasty comments. I'm wondering if I should have just remained complicit. I'm tempted to resubscribe just for the sake of making things a little more peaceful as per an ultimatum my sister-in-law and brother wagered. Am I the jerk? Not the jerk. I honestly don't even need to read this story to tell you you're not the jerk. Why should you have to warn someone who's mooching off you that you're going to cancel your subscription? She wants Netflix. She can pay for her own subscription. Am I the jerk for not including my niece and my daughter's birthday since her parents can't afford it? I'm 31, female. My daughter, who's 8, and my niece, who's also 8, were born 10 days apart. Due to this, ever since they were little, my sister-in-law, who's 29, has always pushed for them to have a shared birthday party. When the girls were younger, around 1 to 4, we used to do shared birthday parties. But my husband and I realized that we were always the ones to foot the bill for everything. Food, decoration, location, etc. The girls also were complete opposites. My daughter has always been more of a tomboy, while my niece is super girly. When my husband and I told sister-in-law and my brother that we won't be doing this shared birthday anymore, they were really upset and it started a huge fight. They said they can't afford to throw a nice birthday for my niece, but we can, so it makes sense that we pay for it since we're family. Yeah, not gonna fly with my husband and I. So we stuck by what we said and ever since the girls have had separate birthdays. My daughter and my husband love watching Formula One together and she wanted to have a Formula One themed birthday this year. The weekend before the birthday, we had a family dinner at my parents' house. Sister-in-law, my brother, and niece were present. My parents were asking the girls if they were excited for their upcoming birthdays and if they were having parties this year. My daughter told my parents she's having a Formula One themed party this year. Sister-in-law answered for my niece and said they're not going to have a party for her because things were tight. The conversation was left there. Fast forward to this past weekend. Daughter's birthday was on Saturday. We had the party and it was going great. 
The whole family was invited, as usual, and everyone was having a great time until the cake. I'm in the kitchen with my mom, mother-in-law, sister-in-law, and a few other family friends talking. I pulled the cake out to get ready to bring it out for everyone. Sister-in-law takes a look at the cake and looks confused. Sister-in-law, is this the girl's birthday cake? Me, what do you mean the girl's? The cake is for my daughter. Sister-in-law, well, I thought since I mentioned that things are tight this year that you'd include niece's name in the birthday. Me, I understand your situation, but how come you never once mentioned this to me? Well, I thought it would be common sense. Now my daughter isn't going to have any kind of celebration for her birthday this year because you and your husband are so selfish. She then stormed out of the kitchen, made a huge scene at the party outside, yelling to her husband and my niece that it's time to go, and they left. Since then, she's been messaging me and my husband nonstop, trying to make us feel guilty that my niece isn't going to have a birthday party and calling us all kinds of names. I feel bad that my niece isn't going to get a birthday party. Am I the jerk for not including her, even though they can't afford it? Not the jerk. First of all, it's simply not your job to make sure your niece has a party. That's up to her parents. If things are tight, maybe they need to be creative, but it's still on them. Secondly, it's ridiculous for her to think that hinting around will get her daughter added to the party. If it was as important to her as she acts like it is, then she should have had a frank conversation with you and simply asked. You could have still said no, but there wouldn't have been the confusion. This is on them, not you. Not the jerk, but I'm very confused. How much money can you possibly invest in an eight-year-old's birthday party? Most of my kids' birthdays have been at the park with a self-made chocolate cake, some sweets, a fruit salad, a treasure hunt, and some balloons. If you want a cool location or a VIP experience or whatever, you can spend more, obviously, but that's completely optional. Kids at that age mostly want to have fun with their friends and blow out their candles. Your trash cans can only be out at a specific time. We live in an HOA, and if you don't, lucky you. We've never had any real problems. They don't do much other than make sure the park and gardens look good. Anyhow, for whatever reason, they decided to add a new rule. It wasn't needed, but I guess they got bored and wanted something to do. Maybe someone kept leaving their trash cans out all week. Fine, just ask them not to. It's not that hard. The new rule states when trash cans can be put out. They can't be out before 6 a.m. on Wednesdays and must be put back before 6 p.m. the same day. This is obviously stupid and has a few problems. First of all, some people use a different company. The HOA provided one goes on Wednesday and it's cheap so most people use it, but you don't have to. Some people have theirs go on Monday or Tuesday. Also, a lot of people here work in the medical field and just aren't home during those times, so no one is there to put out or bring in their cans. So a few of us got together on how to comply, but be annoying about it. We decided to comply with their set times as best we can. Take it out at 6 when a lot of us go to work or go for a morning walk and take it back in at 6 since most of us are home. Some of us help by taking others' bins to the street if they're at work. But when it's time to take out the trash, doing it as loud as possible. Bin has wheels? Drag it. Got it to the street? Make sure it's firmly placed on the street. Need to take out the other bag? Slap it in there and let the lid slam shut. For those who have trash go out on other days, comply with the times but do it on your own trash day. Then also put them out on Wednesday as required. If you can, leave trash in them and leave the lid open so it would bake in the sun all day. Yes, it did smell like hot trash. That's the point. After three weeks of this, an email was sent out. The rule was thrown out and we were all simply asked to put out and take in our cans within a reasonable amount of time, preferably on trash day. Was it really that hard to ask nicely? Why not just address whoever was the problem? Know that, because an HOA rule was changed, a lawyer was paid to look over it before the CCNR could be updated. That means this stupid rule cost every resident money. Anyhow, we are already planning on voting out one member of the board who we know is the problem come the summer election. Am I the jerk for refusing to show my husband the rest of the ultrasound photos of our baby? I, 26 female, am married to Bill, who's 30. We're expecting our first baby together in three weeks but I have an eight-year-old from a previous relationship. To put it lightly, Bill has no filter whatsoever. It's extremely annoying at times since I'm someone that overthinks everything and will go over what I'm about to say 10 times before it leaves my mouth to make sure it's not rude. 
He thinks there might be something wrong with him because he doesn't understand social cues and he's pretty awkward, but he won't get checked for anything. Today I went for an appointment and they did a 4D ultrasound because they haven't been able to see his face lately due to him always sucking on his thumb. I've never had a 4D ultrasound before, so I was excited to see my baby. Of course, like all 4D ultrasounds, the baby looked like a crisp lasagna when you don't know what you're looking at, but still cute and exciting seeing your baby and all of their facial features for the first time. I got home and waited for Bill to come home so I could show him the photos and videos. I have him sit down and I clicked on the best, clearest photo we got to show him first. A few photos he had his hand up or was at a bad angle or the umbilical cord was giving him a handlebar mustache. He looks at the photo and I'm pointing out that his eyes and nose and mouth etc and the first thing out of his mouth is, wow, he's ugly. Immediately I get mad, lock my phone and refuse to show him any other photos. He asked if that was the only photo I got and I said, no, I got more, but why should I show them to you if you're just going to sit there and call him ugly? I was so excited to show you these and you've completely ruined the moment because you don't know how to shut your mouth. He looked shocked that I was mad and said it's fair game because I call the baby names all the time. When I'm in a ton of pain, I'll say things like, this little crap won't get out of my ribs. I told him it was completely different and he claims it's not and he should be allowed to call him ugly and also said hopefully that's not how he'll look when he comes out. I just refused to show him any more photos and I told him to get out of the room. He's mad that I won't show him the rest and still doesn't understand why I'm upset. I'm pregnant, so maybe it's just hormones getting to me. So, am I the jerk? Did I overreact or is he just an idiot? Edit, to answer some common questions I keep getting asked. Is he on the spectrum? We don't know. He and I have both stated that might be the case, but he refuses to get tested because he's scared he might be. I understand this is an issue, but I can't force him to go. I've encouraged him as much as I can and as often as I can, but he doesn't want to get a diagnosis. He was joking. Unfortunately, he wasn't. I poked fun at these types of ultrasounds in my past. I can joke around about it easily. The problem is that he didn't say it in any slight amount of joking away. It was, wow, he's ugly, 100% serious and matter of fact. This was a final straw moment for me. I've been on him for the past two weeks about his comments like this about other people. He's been saying very shallow, judgmental things, and I don't think it's right. You shouldn't call the baby my baby. It's both of yours. I understand where you're coming from, but there's a reason I called him my baby. We got married, agreed we wanted to try for a baby, and tried for several months. This was not a surprise, and we both decided we wanted a baby. After I got pregnant, any single little ow that was uncomfortable, I'm throwing up from all this morning sickness, or anything that wasn't just absolute praise to the baby, I was to, well, you wanted this, every time. I explained how much I didn't like him saying that because it sounds like I'm the only one that wants the baby and he doesn't care and he still says it. We compromised and as a running joke, now I call him my baby because I'm the one that wanted him. When talking about the baby, Bill will often say, my boy or our baby. I never corrected him or have ever said, no, it's my baby, not yours because it's not that serious. But that's why I said my baby in the post. A ton of commenters are saying I'm the jerk because babies are ugly. If you can look your excited pregnant wife in the eyes as she's expressing her joy over seeing the baby that you guys will be holding in just a few short weeks and respond with, it's ugly, then you are the problem. There's a million other things you can say. And now after I give birth on what should be an amazing moment, I'm going to be scared that he's going to say that again instead of focusing on my baby. I'm going to worry if my husband is thinking that the baby's ugly. Luckily, thanks to some lovely Redditors, I have the comeback. He looks just like you in my pocket now. I didn't show him the rest of the photos because I showed him the best ones you could see his face and chubby cheeks perfectly. It didn't look creepy or weird. So if he could look at the best picture and say, you, why would I show him the rest that have his hand in the way or shot a bad angle? There's no point in me having to get my feelings repeatedly hurt just so he can see photos that are considered mess ups anyway. No jerks here. If you were upset by what he said, I can understand why you wouldn't want to show him more. But let's be honest, those photos are very creepy. Why did you have a baby with this guy? Not the jerk, but wow, your husband is something. 
Lack of social cues or not, he doesn't need to say every thought that pops into his head. And you calling the baby a little crap because they are physically in your ribs is not comparable to calling him ugly. Everyone sucks here. You two need to stop it. Seems to be a lot of tension surrounding the birth of your expected baby. Your husband should admit that that was a boneheaded thing to say and you should show him the rest of the pictures. You two better grow up before the real baby gets here. You're the jerk. Dad calling the baby ugly is something you're both supposed to laugh at. Let's face it, lots of newborns are ugly and there's nothing wrong with that. You need to take a chill pill and realize that you're taking life way too seriously. Most babies get less ugly as they get older, so seriously, quit tripping out over small things and just enjoy life. My hubby made jokes about our baby being ugly too, so I'd always hit him with something like, yeah, looks like he's really taking after you unfortunately. Guess what? He stopped calling him ugly after that. By getting mad and freaking out over people saying things, all you're doing is giving them power over you, letting them control your emotions. We need to be able to control our emotions when people say things that upset us and fire back at them with words to give them a taste of their own medicine. Edit. I get that not everyone can come up with witty responses at all times, but I stand by what I said. When you flip out over literal words that someone said to you, you're just showing your lack of self-control. Manager tried throwing me under the bus, so I showed everyone her incompetence. I recently resigned from a toxic workplace as a data analyst at a startup. It was promising at the start, but not long after I noticed many red flags, including the fact that my manager had absolutely no data analysis or management experience prior to being promoted. How can you manage analysts without knowing basic Excel functions? I ignored those red flags and trusted her leadership because I liked the company's goals. Little did I know this would be the worst decision ever. I basically did all the work for a team for the whole year I was there. When I ran the numbers for reporting and analysis of team performances, she always asked me to dumb it down so she can present it to high-level management. I thought everything was going well because I only got good feedback from her and the rest of the team. About a month ago, a coworker who I don't get along with made a complaint about me, which was absolutely untrue. Manager believed it without investigating and all of a sudden, I was placed on a PIP. She spouted all types of lies to HR and when I refuted those claims with written evidence, they doubled down and started gaslighting me. You're just too negative. I refused to sign and was threatened with termination, so I complied and started building a case against them. I knew she was doing the PIP to terminate me and she looked for internal candidates to replace me in secret because she was dumb enough to set the meeting up beside me. Once I signed my contract for a new job, I did basically forget all and started working from home. Before my resignation, she asked me to do some reporting for her, so I ran the numbers and sent her the raw data, told her where the files were located and that she can analyze the data and make the presentation herself. Since she's the data analyst manager, she should know how to do it. She tried reporting me for that, but ultimately backfired because they asked her if the work that I did was actually wrong and was forced to admit she didn't know what she was looking at. Everything else in the team was questioned and I believe they are now being audited by an external investigator. Credibility destroyed. I'm now working for a small manager who is competent and has clear goals for the team, but that was a heck of a ride. Small win against toxic management, but a win is a win. Edit. PIP is a performance improvement plan. It's used by managers to address underperformance and start a documentation process, usually used as a first step to fire someone or phase them out. Am I the jerk for lighting a match at night and scaring my boyfriend's dad? My boyfriend and I are staying at his parents' house. It's been going really well, but his dad is very particular. He has moments every day where he corrects or instructs the other people in the house on how he wants us to behave. I don't really have a problem with it, but he has a few rules that do make me a little uncomfortable. I don't need to get into why, but I always have stomach issues here. I've been visiting them a few times a year for almost a decade and it just is what it is. My boyfriend and I used to stay in a room downstairs with a bathroom and it wasn't a problem, but his brother moved back home and now we don't have our own bathroom. I don't want to advertise the fact that I have stomach issues to everyone in the house and I'm not allowed to use the bathroom fan at night, so I usually use potpourri or just a drop. When we got home the last time, my boyfriend got a text from his dad asking him to ask me to stop using strong essential oils 
as it was making him feel sick. I was so embarrassed and I honestly have been kind of dreading coming here again. I was talking to my mom about this and she suggested that I bring some paper matches because that's what she used to do. I got some paper matches and they actually work pretty well. Tonight I woke up from my sleep because I had stomach issues. I lit a match when I was done, ran it under some water and folded it up into some aluminum before throwing it in the garbage. I fell back asleep and was woken up a while later by a big commotion. My boyfriend's dad smelled burning and thought the house was on fire, so he woke everyone up in a panic and searched the house to see what was burning. I didn't immediately equate a match with a house fire and I didn't smell anything when I woke up, so I didn't bring up that I had lit a match. It wasn't even clicking for me that the match was what he smelled until my boyfriend asked me if I smelled anything when I got up earlier to use the bathroom. Long story short, I just got chewed out by his dad for lighting matches at night or lighting matches in general as a guest in their home. And even his mom was upset because I could have started a fire and nobody would know. I apologized and everyone went back to bed, but then my boyfriend lectured me for like 15 minutes about embarrassing him and playing dumb about not knowing what his dad smelled and not using common sense. And then he told me to go to sleep and try not to wake everyone up again. I'm honestly so upset. My boyfriend is sleeping soundly and I'm just laying here getting madder and madder. I just wanna wake him up so we can leave because I feel so uncomfortable. I really don't wanna face everyone in the morning. I don't feel like I did anything wrong, but I don't know if I'm thinking rationally because I'm tired and I can't fall back asleep. What do you think? Am I the jerk? I think you get stomach issues at these people's home because it's an incredibly stressful environment where you are walking on eggshells the entire time to tiptoe around his extremely volatile and aggressive father. I mean, goodness, have these people never owned a candle? Not the jerk. Not the jerk. Folks, if a match has been run underwater, then short of the intervention of God himself, that match is not going to start a fire. Good grief. Wrapping it in tinfoil is already a step further than reason dictates. Adults can be trusted to dispose of matches. This poor woman has endured repeated visits to this clearly disturbed man's home. She's doing literally everything she can think of to be respectful of his deranged behavior. Something is wrong with this family. At a minimum, they're enabling the father's personality disorder. Stay away from these people. You're the jerk. Lighting matches in someone else's home is a huge no-no. All it takes is one little mistake and you can be the cause of a house fire that burns down their entire house. Not smart or necessary in any way. If you want to cause potential fires in your own home, you have every right. But to take this risk in someone else's home, they had every right to be furious and I would have done the same. Next time, try not to light any fires in other people's homes in the middle of the night while they're asleep. Woman confuses me for employee, gets locked out of the store leaving her groceries behind. So last night I'm finishing up my shift as an EMT and it's been a long and tiring one. The calls weren't bad, but there were a lot of them and we were all over the county. Shift is over, I change back into my comfy clothes, sweats, t-shirt and hoodie and I head to the store to get something for dinner. I get there just in time since they're closing in 10 minutes. I assure the cashier that I was just grabbing something quick and I go and pick up a lasagna from the frozen section. I grab it and turn to head to the checkout when I hear Ahem. Not a throat clearing sound, but someone saying it like they were reading it out loud. I turn around and I see a woman who snaps off with, I need you to go in the back and get me a pack of the frozen pretzels. I say that I don't work here and point out where an employee just went behind an end cap. She snaps. You do work here and you need to stop being lazy and get me my pretzels. I again say, I don't work here and I turn to walk to the self check. She flips and storms off muttering about lazy employees and managers. I finish checking out and I'm grabbing my stuff and leaving when I see her again with the cart and a manager and she yells, There she is! That's the lazy jerk! And she starts towards me. I'm not even going to engage and so I hold up my receipt and my one item to the self-check girl and I walk out. I hear the manager raising his voice and saying, Ma'am! Ma'am! Turns out, she left her cart behind and stormed out of the store to confront me. I get in my car to drive off, but she's standing in front of it so I can't go anywhere. She's also giving me a lashing that I'm too checked out to really pay attention to. Great, I'm already on my last nerve and this is just too much. Manager sticks his head out of the door and hollers, Ma'am! 
she turns and makes a hushing motion towards him. He hollers, ma'am, one more time, and she hollers back, saying, I'm dealing with your employee, since you're too much of a little jerk to do it yourself. He bristles and says, madam. She cuts him off with, shut up, screeched at the top of her lungs. He shrugs, and I watch him go back inside, fiddle with the locks, flips the sign to closed, and pulls down the shades. As I'm watching this, she gets annoyed that I'm not paying her my full attention, and she yells, What are you looking at that's so important to ignore me? I just pointed at the shop and say, They just closed and locked the doors. I'm not sure what she screamed since it was pretty incoherent, but she did run towards the door. Seeing my chance, I drove off, leaving her pounding on the door and yelling. Am I the jerk for leaving the room when my boyfriend enters? I'm 35 female, my boyfriend is 38 male, and we've been dating for a long time, about 7 years. I moved into his house after a year of dating. He works Monday through Friday, 9 to 5 job. I take contract work and my days and hours vary week to week. I'm an introvert, but I work with lots of people and basically always have to be on at work, so I absolutely require time to myself to recharge. Early on living together, I like to plan one of my days off on a weekday so I could have the house to myself. But frequently, he'd choose to work from home or take a sick day on that day, and I would get frustrated when he didn't leave for work that day. When I expressed this frustration, he'd get annoyed and angry. I told him that I just need time to myself occasionally. It honestly has nothing to do with him. And he responded, How could it not have anything to do with me? You just told me you don't want to be around me. Plus, this is my house. I'll be here when I want to be. I adapted and got used to living with less alone time for myself. Things changed during lockdown. He now works from home every day. He gave up some of his hobbies as well, and it feels like he never leaves the house anymore. I still work contract work out of the house, but I know that I will have virtually no time that is truly to myself when I'm home. I do all the grocery shopping and lots of other errands as a means to be alone with myself, between the drive and the shopping time. Sometimes I just sit in my car in the parking lot or in the garage for like an hour in total silence when I drive somewhere. Sometimes he wonders what has taken me so long and I tell him that I just took my time with the errand. But I still need space because I feel drained all the time now and when I mention that it would be nice to have some alone time, he dismisses it and says, where would I even go right now? Now I frequently wear earbuds around the house, sometimes not even playing anything to cancel out some noise. If I'm in a room alone and he enters without an obvious plan to interact with me, I'll get up and move to a different room where I can continue to be by myself. Example, if I'm sitting on the couch in the living room and he enters the kitchen right next to me and plays a podcast on the Echo and starts making food, I don't ask him to turn off the podcast or leave. I just silently get up and move to the office. Or if he comes into the office, maybe I'll go down to the basement and sit on the laundry table. I didn't ask him to leave the space or to stop making noise. I simply remove myself to continue my alone time. Sometimes he thinks I'm being passive aggressive or mad at him and gets frustrated with me. As far as I'm concerned, I've expressed my need to have some space and if he can't understand, that's on him. I see it as a compromise to have my alone time and meet his needs as well. So am I the jerk for creating my alone time by whatever means necessary? Edit for clarity. I work out of the house, two jobs, 60 to 70 hours per week. Lots of human interaction at both. He works from home full time since lockdown. To clarify, I don't leave the room every time he walks in. It's once or twice per week when he comes into the space I have specifically put myself in to be alone. Almost always when I get home from work, after saying hi and checking in. For example, Hey, how was your day? That's great. My day was super busy. So I'm heading back downstairs to relax while you finish your work day. Still want tacos for dinner? Yeah? Cool. Let's eat at 5.30 before I leave for job number two. If he comes down to interact with me, talk to me, help me with whatever I'm working on, then I stay and hang out with him. But when he's just making noise in the room where he knows I'm trying to quietly relax, I do relocate sometimes. Edit 2. Not sure where this idea came from that I live for free in his house, and frankly, I'm not sure why it's relevant. We split all expenses based on our income ratio. I pay 45% and he pays 55% of all expenses including mortgage, insurance, utilities, internet, groceries, house and yard maintenance, etc. I also really enjoy cooking as a hobby and have some dietary needs, so I do nearly all of the grocery shopping, cooking, meal prep, 
breakfast, lunch, and dinner to cover both of our meals for about five of the days a week. Probably done responding now. Thanks for all the feedback. It's been helpful and insightful, and I appreciate the different perspectives. Peace. You're not the jerk for needing time to yourself, but you need to take a long look in the mirror and ask if this is a relationship that's sustainable. You have to very clearly communicate what you need from your partner and come up with solutions together. And if he can't compromise with you for your benefit, this is not the relationship for you. Respecting your partner's need for space is absolutely necessary. I myself do not need to spend every moment with my partner and he's very much like your boyfriend. I just had to tell him that I needed time to myself when we were home. He could play his games and I could watch TV in the living room or read, but I couldn't entertain him all the time. Not the jerk. He is for not letting you have some time to yourself. It's a perfectly reasonable and perfectly normal request. He makes it about him and ignores your needs. You're going to go crazy if you guys don't work this out. If he won't accept that you need some space, do you really want to spend the rest of your life sitting in your car in the garage every time you need to be alone? Everyone sucks here. You both need better communication skills. Tell him outright that you need to be alone and set boundaries for yourself. Maybe set up a day with him where he knows to leave you the heck alone. I'm the exact same way as you. I don't think I can ever live with a partner because my alone time needs are so high. Definitely not the jerk. It sounds like he literally never leaves the house. That would drive me crazy. Can you maybe do a staycation by yourself? You're the jerk. You're upset that your boyfriend is in his house and working from his house and you don't get alone time again in his house. Your solution to your boyfriend having the audacity to be in his home too much is to childishly leave the room. Move out if it's such a problem and rent an apartment. Honestly, if you think your boyfriend being in his home is a problem, you should end it. He shouldn't be expected to leave his house to accommodate you wanting alone time. The entitlement of you and everyone in the comments, mad he won't compromise about being in his house? You paying rent doesn't change anything about it being only his house. At best, you're a tenant, and that's only if you have a contract. Do this next. Tap here on your screen to come see our new podcast playlist, where you'll find thousands of hours of the best stories you've ever heard. Or tap the one on the right. That episode is specifically just for you, based on other videos you've enjoyed the most.